All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing of the Land Use Committee. I am Councilmember Rafael Salamanca and I am the chair of the committee. Today we will be examining the fiscal 2020, 2020 per preliminary budget and the fiscal 2019 preliminary mayor's management report uh, for LPC. And with that, I just want to recognize my esteemed colleagues uh, who are members of the committee that are present today, we have Council Members Gibson, Barron, Chair Kalos, Reynoso, Richards, Gredenchik, Chair Adams, Diaz, and Council Member Rivera. And now I will hand it off to uh, Chair Adams. Thank you very much, Chair Salamanca, and good day to all who are here for this hearing. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, the chair of the Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. This hearing will cover the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2019 preliminary mayor's management report for the Landmark Preservation Commission, or LPC. Uh, with that also, since my colleague has introduced our colleagues with us, we also have uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission. LPC is the largest municipal preservation agency in the nation. It carries out its responsibility for protecting New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites by granting them landmark or historic district status and regulating them after designation. This hearing will focus on LPC's $6.8 million fiscal 2020 preliminary budget, which, while small, holds a particular importance to the fabric and history of our great city. As communities evolve, so too should the landmark designation process. We should ask ourselves as a city, whose story is being told through our landmark designations? Is the landmark designation process reflected of the diverse New York City community? who decides what story our landmark should tell. These are some of the questions we hope the commissioner will be able to answer for us today. We always look forward to working with LPC towards improving the land use process, and I would like to thank Commissioner Sarah Carroll, chair of the Landmark Preservation Commission, and her staff for joining us today. Council, will you please swear in the panel? And before responding, please state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Sarah Carroll, I do. Gardia Capehart, I do. Lisa Krasavage, I do. Ali Rasulinajad, I do. Thank you all very much. You may proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Salamanca and Chair Adams, and good afternoon to you and the members of the Land Use Committee. It is an honor to come before this body for a hearing on the Landmarks Preservation Commission's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget and my first budget in the capacity as chair of the commission. I am joined today by Lisa Kersavage, our executive director, Gardier Caphart, our director of financial management, and Ali Razulanajad, our Director of Community and Intergovernmental Affairs. As you know, the Commission's mission is to protect the significant architectural, historical, and cultural resources of our city. In the nearly 25 years I have worked at LPC, I have seen firsthand the power of preservation to revitalize communities, to support economic development, and bring pride of place across all five boroughs. Since 1965, when Mayor Robert Wagner signed Introduction 653 into law, the Commission has designated more than 36,500 buildings, districts, and sites throughout the five boroughs. Essential to the continued protection and preservation of these and future designations are the resources available to the Commission. With that, I will begin my testimony today with an overview of our preliminary budget and then discuss my priorities for the agency, including how the pillars of equity, efficiency, and transparency will support our work. The LPC's adopted budget of fiscal 2019, fiscal year 2019, was 6.68 million, and for fiscal year 2020, the preliminary budget is 6.84 million, which consists of 6.22 million in city funds and 617,000 in federal community development block grant funds. 
The 158,000 increase in our budget is primarily due to collective bargaining increases for union employees and mayoral increases for managers and original jurisdiction employees. Of the overall preliminary budget, 91%, which is 6.21 million, is allocated to personnel services, and 9%, 630,000, to other than personnel services. Our budget supports the agency's five departments, including the research department, responsible for evaluating and advancing properties for designation, the preservation department that reviews permit applications for work on designated properties, the enforcement department that investigates complaints of potential violations and helps owners correct non-compliances, and the archaeology and environmental review departments that assist city, state, and federal agencies in their environmental review process. The agency's total headcount in the preliminary fiscal year 2020 budget is 85, including 77 full-time positions and eight part-time positions. Of the CDBG funding, about 80% is allocated to personnel supporting critical community development related functions such as surveys, environmental review, archaeology, community outreach, and education. While about 20% of, uh, or approximately 115,000, is allocated for our historic preservation grant program for low income homeowners and not for profit organizations. I will now discuss the work of the Commission that these resources will support. First, starting with research and designations. In fiscal year 2018, we designated 17 individual landmarks, two historic districts, one interior landmark, and one scenic landmark for a total of 481 buildings and sites. Among these designations are the New York Public Library's main reading room and catalog room, the Empire, Star Empire State Dairy Company building and complex in East New York, the Coney Island Boardwalk, and three individual landmarks in East Harlem. I am especially proud of the designation of the Central Harlem Historic District, which is not only architecturally significant, but also a remarkable reminder of the substantial role that the African American community of Harlem played in creating political and social change in New York City and the nation. In fiscal year 2019, we have designated three individual landmarks and one historic district to date. These include 550 Madison Avenue, the former AT&T headquarters building and the world's first postmodern style skyscraper. 236 President Street in Brooklyn, the first purpose-built free kindergarten in the borough, and the Park Terrace West, West 217th Street Historic District, a significant enclave of revival-style residential architecture in Inwood. We have spent the last several months conducting extensive surveys, studies, and evaluations for potential future designation proposals. One of those surveys resulted in prioritizing four potential historic districts in Sunset Park, which the Commission voted to calendar in January. This neighbor neighborhood does not have a historic district today, but with the calendaring of these four districts, more than 500 buildings are now being considered for landmark protection. These districts contain distinctive streetscapes that represent the history of the working and middle class community that developed here in the early 20th century. Moving forward, I am committed to ensuring that the agency continues to recognize the buildings and communities that reflect the city's diversity, to protect historic resources in communities that have been less well represented by designations, and to tell the story of all New Yorkers through our designations. Since my tenure began as chair, we have prioritized studies of historic resources related to immigrant, LGBT, and labor history, as well as residential and industrial heritage throughout the five boroughs. I will now turn to our preservation and permitting operations. The key to success in preservation is effective re regulation, which requires an efficient, transparent, and accessible process for applicants. Buildings are living, thriving contributors to the dynamism of New York City. Our job is not to prevent change, but to manage it. 
so that we ins can ensure that these buildings and sites are protected and allowed to adapt to remain vi a vital part of our city's continued growth. Our preservation department is the largest department within the commission and is the regulatory arm of our agency. Our staff are professionally trained preservationists who work with property and business owners to help them obtain approval for work that meets their needs and is sensitive to the historic building and context. Each year, approximately 94 to 97% of permits are issued by the staff pursuant to the commission's rules. The remaining three to 6% of the applications are reviewed by the full commission. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission received 14,011 permit applications and took action on 12,563 applications, ranging from restoration and repairs to windows and storefronts to additions and new buildings. Through the first half of this fiscal year, we have received 6,858 applications and have taken action on 6,361 applications. Additionally, over the past calendar year, we engaged in a comprehensive public process to streamline the permit review and approval for everyday work. The effort culminated in the unanimous adoption of our major amendments and new rules. These updated rules will be easier to use and will increase transparency and efficiency for those who interact with the commission, from homeowners and small businesses who file for permits to community boards and preservation groups who weigh in on these projects. A variety of new and expanded work types are included in the amended rules, such as provisions for barrier-free access and to improve energy efficiency and resiliency in historic buildings. Outreach and education are also essential to our success. Since my tenure began, our commitment to raising awareness about the benefits and responsibilities of preservation has been tangible. We have ramped up our community outreach and began publishing new educational materials. Our aim in this effort is twofold, to boost support for historic preservation and designations, and to educate and make our processes more accessible to applicants and the public. We hope that these materials and increased accessibility will improve the public's interaction with the Commission. For fiscal year 2019, we are on track to participate in or host 36 outreach sessions with the public and community groups, an amount higher than any in the Commission's recent history, and double the number of events from just five years ago. During outreach events, agency staff discuss a range of material, including the Commission's history and designation process, instruction on how to obtain permits for work, and funding opportunities available to owners of historic properties, including the Commission's own Historic Preservation Program. I am confident that these outreach events will have a palpable impact on improving the public's accessibility to the Commission and compliance with the Landmarks Law. In addition to our increased presence in communities, we have taken a number of steps to enhance transparency through technology upgrades. Just prior to the start of the fiscal year and as a part of our process to amend the Commission's rules, we launched two unique online tools. There is a new interactive web map that for the first time allows users to geographically see both proposed and approved work at all landmarks and buildings within historic districts. There is also an enhanced search tool allowing users to search for relevant work types within specific community districts. Building on that work in December 8, 2018, as a response to feedback from community boards, I directed staff to develop and launch a monthly reporting system for community boards. This system, implemented in February, relays all permits issued and applications filed to each community board at the beginning of each month, providing greater transparency and access to the agency's regulatory work than ever before. Finally, we are updating, revising, and creating a variety of new and easy to follow guides and fact sheets for those interacting with the commission. During the fall, we released our updated guidelines for archeological work in New York City, the product of a state grant and consultation with over 100 stakeholders. 
Shortly thereafter, we began to publish a series of one-page fact sheets, and more recently, we have begun work on a comprehensive update to our permit application guide, which we will provide applicants with step-by-step -step instructions on filing and completing their applications for work. Before I conclude, I want to return to the Historic Preservation Grant Program, a modest, federally funded initiative targeted for low and moderate income homeowners and not-for-profit organizations to help restore and repair the facades of their landmark buildings. It, for fiscal year 2019, the program has awarded three $30,000 grants to three not-for-profits. They include the Stuyvesant Heights Christian Church in Bedford-Stuyvesant Expanded Stuyvesant Heights Historic District, the Little Theater, an individual and interior landmark in the Theater District, and the Biltmore Theater, an interior landmark also in the Theater District, which is less, also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So in summary, we are excited for the future of preservation in New York City and thank the administration and the council for your continued support and the resources provided in this budget. We are a small agency and nearly the entirety of our budget is personnel based. This is a hardworking and dedicated staff with an outsized impact on our city, responsible for the protection and preservation of its most significant buildings, districts, and sites. Our commitment is that we will continue to do so with the resources provided and strive to do so equitably, efficiently, and transparently. Thank you again for allowing me to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chair Carroll, for your testimony. Um, I want to direct some of my questions towards the historic preservation grants uh, that your agency gets from the uh, a federally funded initiative. What was the total amount that LPC received in funding from the federal government for fiscal year 19? So the, the agency receives um, six, about a little over 600,000 in CD money. The uh, nearly 500,000 of that um, funds personnel services that relate to uh, community activity and planning activities such as our environmental review, survey work, and, and outreach, as well as our historic preservation grant program. Specifically, $115,000 is allocated to the historic preservation grant program. So you receive $600,000 from the federal government? It comes to OMB. It and comes to OMB. So 600000 goes to, to LPC. And of that 600000 500000 is used for personnel services? That's it's, it's a little less than that, but close to it. It's about 495000 495, And so about 115000 of it goes to the these um, to the historic grant. preservation grants. That's correct. Now, is that a number that is required by the federal government, that 115, or is that something that LPC sets aside themselves out of that 600,000? That is something that we work with OMB to, and we set aside for it, and to date, we have been meeting the demand of all eligible applicants. So, but, so my question is, that $600,000, what percentage of it has to go to grants? Which percentage of it is required by the federal government to go to grants. And because I'm seeing that you're getting the, the biggest percentage of the 600,000 is going to per, personnel services. So the 115,000 is what is set aside for the grant program. Th who sets that aside? The federal government or the city of New York? The, the city of New York. So in essence, that entire $600,000 can go to grant money for the city, for, for the city of New York. No, no, we have vital personnel that are funded by that grant, that, that CD money. Um, but I would add that, you know, we review applications, uh, you know, every year on a rolling basis. There's no deadline. And we have um, been able to uh, award grants to all eligible worthy applicants. So, I mean, 91% of your funding comes from the city. Right. That's correct. So you're getting you're getting the six hundred thousand dollars from the federal government, 
and you're utilizing 500,000 of that for personal services. Why are you not utilizing the 91% of the money that you're getting from the city for personal services and utilizing that $600,000 for grant opportunities for New Yorkers? So, I, you know, I think that the CD money funds, as I said, extremely vital personnel that, um, in, including our grant program personnel, but, um, I do also want to say that, again, that if there were a need for more funding, we could work with OMB on that, but to date, we have been able to meet the demand. How many applications were submitted in fiscal year 19? How many were granted? Well, I see three were granted. How many were submitted and how many were denied? So we, we did receive... Um, do we We've received uh, 12 applications. Right, and um, seven of those did not meet the, either the HUD income requirement or the HUD requirement that the rental unit in the building be affordable. And in one case, the owner did not occupy the building, which is another HUD requirement. So seven of the 12 did not meet the, the HUD eligibility requirements, and then beyond that, the five others, we awarded three, and two applications are currently under review. And again, there, you know, these come in on a rolling basis, so that's why the two are currently under How review. many staff members do you have set aside just for this grant process? We have three positions who work within this program. We have a grant administrator, a grant coordinator, and uh, a grant intern. So these three positions, you tell me that they're, they're in combination, they are getting a salary of half a million dollars? No. Though these are positions that um, actually they, they are people who work in other positions within the agency and they also work in this um, program, but the CD money funds, it specifically has to fund planning efforts and community efforts. And so it is. it funds some of our survey work for designations. It funds our environmental review and archaeology departments and our grant intern. How can we get a breakdown of how this $500,000 is actually being allocated? We can here? provide that to you. Uh, Detail line by line. Yes. I mean, I don't need names of, of employees, but you know, we can give you. I the mean, you could tell, give breakdown. me uh, what the salary is and w how much is being is actually being spent in surveys. I see that this year, for the first time, there was a religious institution that was awarded this preservation grant. Mm -hmm. um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I put in a, 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 a bill yeah. requesting that there there be grant money set aside for religious institutions. Um, in my district, I have. I have a, a church that was built in the 1800s. Um, we took them out of uh, the landmark status. They were in, in, in the process, in the application process, because there was concerns that, you know, they depend on donations from their parishioners, and I represent a very low-income community. Mm -hmm. And the concerns were that if should they need to have structural or capital needs, they would not be able to afford them. Um, but I want to preserve that building. So um, how were you able to approve this religious institution, number one? And number two, what's the status of my bill? Because uh, I know that we were holding off on it because we were, exp we were waiting for a response from yeah. HUD uh, to tell us if, if they can approve this, this type of okay. request. So um, we, the first question is how were we able to provide this grant? And that is because the, the grant is for restoration work on a portion of the building that is used as a daycare, so not for a portion of the building that is used for worship. And um, number two, we still have not received a response from HUD, so we work very closely with OMB to get guidance on how to interpret that requirement. All right, and my last question on this matter, how much what was the total amount that you, well, you received $600,000 from, er, consistently, is it, is it the same amount every year, every fiscal year? Consistently, about that amount. About the same amount. I think it's actually for fiscal 2020, it's 630000 Okay, so it went yeah. up. So for fiscal year, we're, you're, we're still working on fiscal year 19. For fiscal year 18, uh, how much was set aside for grant opportunities? It's the same, 115000 right, So that means that, you, and you only utilize 95000 of that money. That's correct. So that money goes back to OMB? That money goes back to OMB. 
And do you keep track of that money? So it is, it, it's not our money to keep track of, but what I would say is that we are actively seeking applicants for our grant program. So what does so OMB we, do we with that? We continue to Sorry. allow a applications. What, do you know what OMB did with that extra, um, was it 15, $20,000? I do not. So they just put it back into the general fund. Right, OMB determines how the funding Even is though allocated. that money was allocated specifically for your agency. That's correct. I have concerns with that. All right, I'm gonna sign it off to the chair of the committee, Chair Adams. Thank you very much, Chair Salamanca. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Chair Carroll and your staff for being here today. I have a few questions before I turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, four questions. Specific note is taken uh, in uh, landmarking in the city of New York, particularly for me since I've been chairing this committee uh, for a little over a year now, and realizing that it is very, very Manhattan-centric, if you will, and I'm sure that's no secret to any of you or anybody here in this room today. My question and my concern is outreach to other areas of the city uh, who have not been afforded, if you will, the same uh, consideration for landmarking, why that is, what your plans are to change that. Uh, we mentioned a, a portion of uh, Harlem, the historical district that mm -hmm. was uh, uh, named last year, which I was re really happy. But in doing that and speaking to members of the community surrounding this designation, uh, as, as historic as Harlem is, it is maybe 2% or less than 2% uh, landmarked. And particular question was brought to me as the chair of the committee why that would be in a city like, the, like this that celebrates Harlem. So before I get any further than that, can you just address that? Yes, yeah, so I think that um you know, it is true that there are many Manhattan uh, landmarks in Manhattan, and it's interesting, actually, the highest number of buildings and sites designated is actually in Brooklyn, but there are certainly um, communities with a lot of activism and um, advocacy in these two boroughs. We have, just to sort of answer the, the first question, we, um, in particular, I have taken a great interest in expanding our outreach to communities across all five boroughs to try to generate support and, um, and to support designations and to be able to include uh, more diverse communities that represent our, our entire rich city and our future designations. Specifically in Harlem, we, um, we have been working very, with, we actually have a number of historic districts in Harlem and we have been working very closely with um, Save Harlem Now and Community Board 10. Community Board 10 did put together a preservation plan and at this point we have designated three of the historic districts from that plan and we continue to work in the neighborhood and in fact we're embarking on another study very soon. That is great to hear and um, that's really what I wanted to hear that you were working with the community groups to increase that percentage, yeah. particularly in Harlem, even though we want to see some things done in Queens as well. I uh, just want to make that clear <laughs> also. So there are more potential designations coming to the commission related to buildings with cultural significance, i.e. Stonewall Inn and Young Lord's Church in East Harlem. These are buildings that don't necessarily have the architectural merit that the LPC is used to seeing, so financial incentives that are designed to preserve the exteriors of historic facades may not be helpful in preserving many historic cultural resources. Sources. Is the LPC willing to develop new tools to address the needs of cultural landmark designations? So, you know, I think one thing is, is individual landmarks with cultural history have long been history, uh, long been recognized by the commission, but it is an, a uh, priority for me to continue to look at designations that represent all aspects of our cultural history and even architecturally distinctive buildings um, we're trying to bring more of the cultural history into those designations as well. With respect to the, the architectural character of the buildings, when we look at properties with cultural significance, especially where there isn't architectural significance, the fabric of the building that gets regulated by us after designation must embody that cultural significance. So for example, with Stonewall Inn, the facade um, dates to the period of the event. 
um, and or Louis Armstrong's house is a, a, a relatively modest house, but he lived there for an, a very long period, and he made alterations to the buildings, and that building retains the appearance it did when he lived there and made those changes. So um, the fabric does need to reflect that cultural significance, and so therefore the financial incentives that would be available for any landmark for restoration or repair to maintain it in that intact, um, maintained manner would apply for buildings with cultural significance as well. Okay, thank you. And thank you for referencing Armstrong House as well. It's another yeah. um, uh, landmark that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, okay, in, in addressing legacy businesses, in recent years, there's been growing interest in creating new tools to help preserve longtime independent businesses. One tool created in San, San Francisco is a legacy business registry in which longtime businesses apply for listing and must demonstrate that they have contributed to neighborhood history and identity. A special subsidy program is available to businesses that are named to the list. Has LPC undertaken any research or consideration for a program like this that would celebrate and help preserve longtime businesses outside of a traditional landmark designation? Right. So I am familiar with the program. I don't know it in great detail, and I think it would be worth um, studying. We certainly um, would love to support s businesses, especially businesses that have been very um, critical to the city's history. And in, you know, when we regulate businesses, I think that we are very mindful that our regulations should be flexible enough to, um, uh, to uh, meet their needs. And you know, so things like storefronts and awnings and signage, we have rules that allow a lot of flexibility so that we can support them. Um, and so you know, one thing to think about, I think, is that we don't regulate use or tenancy. And uh, as a regulatory agency, I think it would merit some exploration of whether we would be the appropriate agency to determine who should benefit from this. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting program and worth exploring. OK. I, I encourage you to do, th do yeah. that. That would be wonderful. In taking a look at uh, owner opposition, to landmark, and we know that we've seen this uh, over the past year or so. I think that I probably had the most exciting entree into this committee <laughs> and seeing some very interesting things that I was told never happened before. <laughs> so I take credit for that, good or bad. <laughs> so we've gone through some times uh, last year. What are the major issues that owners opposed to landmark designation give to you? So I think that um, owners, the most common fears are um, the cost and time that regulation will um, involve. And so they have cur you know, concerns about cost and, and uh, delays in getting permits. And in fact, you know, we work very, very closely with property owners as we move through the designation process before we even con formally um, consider an, a property. And when we start to think about it, we meet with owners very early on to try to address those concerns. And I think that um, you know, that relationship building is very Im important because after designation, obviously, we will have a continued relationship. And, and that relationship, if it's a good relationship, is the best way to uh, kind of avoid those kinds of concerns. Um, but you know, I think many of those concerns actually don't bear out. I think it's the kind of the initial fear of an agency having some oversight over changes you want to make. But the reality is, is we are a very user-friendly, accessible agency, and we work very hard to be efficient and to be able to meet people's needs. It's important to us that buildings continue to adapt and, and meet um, property owners' needs. And so we work very hard to, to do that in an efficient and accessible way. Thank you. I've actually seen a lot of that in motion. So I can appreciate those comments as well. We know that we've had interesting yes. times. <laughs> so I, I can appreciate those comments <laughs> as well. Have you had to alter at all the designation process to respond to any of these concerns? So we have um, done a few uh, steps in our process. One is that we have uh, so we start to do more, more research early on in the process so that when we begin to talk to property owners, we have more information for them to help them understand 
why we're interested and what particular aspects would be protected um, and which aspects might not need regulation so that we can have more, um, you know, uh, clearer conversations earlier on before we even enter into the process. And then, of course, now before we have a public hearing, we make the draft designation report available to them, which is also something that didn't happen in the past. And so this way they, again, are fully informed and we've had a dialogue with them about uh, what, what we're interested in. Um, and the other, um, and, and we do spend a lot of time, as I said, in meeting with owners, and particularly in historic districts. We're out in communities many times as we go through the process. The other um, aspect of the designation, of course, is the council's support. So we work very closely with the council. And I think another new change we've made is recently we've been um, providing your team with uh, as much information as we can or as early on in the process as we can. Yes, we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions. I may have some more um, in a second round, but uh, we'll have questions now from Council Members Richards, Kalos, and Ku, in that order. Thank you, Chairs, and I uh, want to just follow up on, I think, what uh, Chair Adams was alluding to, and I'm looking at your citywide landmark designations map. And first, I want to thank you because I think we got two landmarks in Far Rockaway, yes, we did. Uh, both the priest and, and the firehouse. Um, but and that's step forward. Um, we still have a long way to go. But as you look on this map, um, the, the, the further south you go, it seems like, you know, I don't know if we just don't have enough civic pride or um, we're, not, we're not a city attraction. But, you know, last I checked in St. Albans, you know, it's the home of Jackie Robinson and um, ja so many jazz greats, I, I can't even name them all. Um, so I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more uh, on as you look towards the future of landmarks, and I know you're sort of adjusting here now. Um, how are you looking from the equity lens yeah. um, to ensure that communities, Southeast Queens, Queens period, has so much culture, uh, coming to America, part two is coming out. I mean, you know, there has to be something going on in Queens, and it's just not reflective, reflecting it on this particular map. Yeah, and I think, you know, to speak to the Jackie Robinson home and the jazz musicians, we actually do have a lot of that history captured in our Addisley Park Historic District, which we are, you know, very excited about, and we have done a number of- What is the status of that, by the way? That it's, it's going through it's, finally, it's, right? Okay. It's been a district been for a couple of years now, but we have also spent a lot of time with uh, the community doing outreach sessions since designation. And so I think, um, you know, we just haven't seen as much advocacy in some of these areas, but it's incredibly important to us that we um, identify designation opportunities that do represent the entirety of the city. And so we are really, um, that's why I think it's really important that we increase our presence in all of these neighborhoods to try to raise awareness. And, and, and what could we idea. do to be helpful so in this conversation? In many of our um, outreach sessions that we've been holding in the fall, we have partnered with local council members to host us or provide a, a forum for us. And so we would be happy to partner with you to talk about doing a session in your community district. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Koop. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Sarah Kell. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is uh, I want to, is the Manhattan is the highest number of city landmarks, but you just said uh, Brooklyn has the highest Largest landmark, number of yeah. buildings and sites. So we, I, I was mistaken then. Uh, but anyway, uh, but we know that there has been a push to get more areas outside of Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, to get landmark. Even yeah. I found out Flushing is really old, you know, it was founded yeah. 1645, maybe before New York City. Mm -hmm. So even in my area, there must be a lot of landmark uh, a lot of buildings capable of being landmark, you know. 
So can you provide me a breakdown by borrow of where the LPC funds are being spent? Okay, so we are, you know, our um, research department that does surveys is, works all across all five boroughs to survey. So I don't know that I can do a breakdown, but we can try to think about how we can uh, uh, analyze that for you. But we do look across all um, five boroughs and the staff is deployed uh, equally across, across the city. So, yeah. And we, you know, we are, as a, as a resident of Queens myself, I am very interested in looking for opportunities in Queens. And I think it's just, it's a matter of really partnering with the members of the community to um, generate some excitement. Okay, thanks. Mm. Councilmember Kalos. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you enjoying uh, le leading the uh, LPC after so many years uh, in, as a staff person? I, I am enjoying it and it's a very exciting time. Thank you. Uh, I have had occasion to send requests for evaluation mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the LPC, and I believe almost all of them are outstanding. Since, since you've had a chance to come on, I haven't seen any of them move forward. Uh, in particular, I have schools that are over 100 years old in our district uh, that are part of a progressive era where we literally have city and suburban, which was the first middle class built purpose-built housing, uh, and they built John Jay Park with a, with, with a bathhouse to provide it, and uh, I'm not sure if the bathhouse is landmarked. I, you, you would know better than I, mm -hmm. but perhaps we should put in an RFP on that too, and then we have that, and then across the street we have a library. We haven't heard back on that at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Jan Hoos Church, mm -hmm. which was uh, built in, I believe, 1908, it has survived to this day, providing homeless services, children's services, uh, 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 give me three seconds, uh, la la uh, there's lactation support groups, it, AA, like we've got everything there and it's been there for over 100 years and it just got purchased to be redeveloped and so uh, I think we're at this point and if I need to get on my hands and knees, I would, but um, since this is a budget hearing, I would just say, how much money do you need so that your staff can uh, adequately address these and what is the status on these important RFEs? Okay. So um, the, the request for evaluation, and we'll look at it, you should have received responses for them, but when we get re requests for, for evaluation, and we get about 100 a year, um, we look at those to determine um, eligibility under the Landmarks Law, and if they appear to meet the criteria for designation and may merit, then they become part of our general inventory of areas that we're serving, uh, surveying around the city, um, and decisions to prioritize or advance certain items are based on many factors, including architectural, cultural, historical significance, um, agency priorities, so for example, looking equitably across all five boroughs and all communities, and, um, and, uh, compar and also comparative analysis with other similar uh, designated and undesignated buildings. So there are many factors in determining which items from that inventory advance at any given time. We are actively looking at Yorkville. Um, we currently have um, one property calendared. We are um, uh, very near to calendaring another property um, that speaks also to the immigrant history in Yorkville. And Jan Hus is an architectural gem that also really speaks to the cultural history. So we are actively looking at that as well. Uh, may I have a uh, follow-up question? Just give me a second to remember that question. Uh, to our calendar. I will ask if there's a second question. <laughs> you have one minute. And, and just to correct the record, there are actually two in Yorkville that are currently calendared. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a couple more that I'm going to yield to a Chair Salamanca. Um, uh, Councilmember Richards 
brought Queens into the picture as, as I did previously as well, uh, Chair Carroll, and you being from Queens also, we're looking uh, for items to be landmarked in Queens, and if we're looking, I say look no further than the Unisphere. Um, which should have been landmarked a long time ago. So, uh, I mean, the entire World's Fair campus, if you will. So I'll just throw that out there. I don't know yeah. what's going on with that. but Actually, the Unisphere is landmarked. Is it? Yeah. Okay. What about the rest of the campus? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we are, uh, we, we've been thinking about that okay. as well. Okay, all right, I'm gonna keep that out there then. What is the process for choosing potential landmarks or historic district designations to research? So again, we are surveying areas across the city as well as getting requests from to look at properties by the public. And so we look at all of those and then in determining which ones to move forward, we, um, and again, the sort of the minimum threshold is that they need to be 30 years or older or, and significant architecturally, culturally, or historically. And in the case of a historic district, that the, the collection of buildings has a distinct sense of place. And um, so we, um, uh, you know, we are looking at areas all the time for potential resources. And when we think about which items to advance, we, um, you know, some of the decisions we make to prioritize have to do with equity across the five boroughs, trying to spread designations in, um, that represent all communities, um, looking at areas that are actually less well represented by designations already, and, um, and of course looking at areas that have um, significant cultural uh, um, history as well. So the, the and you know these are all sort of the ideas that we think about as we think about which items to push forward. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll just ask one more uh, question and then I will uh, yield to uh, Chair Salamanca. Now, w you mentioned um, I, I guess local um, community groups. To what extent does LPC rely on input from elected officials, community groups, local activists? To what extent is that compared to the work that you proactively set out to do. Yeah. I think um, we we welcome that support, and we are are very always excited to hear from community groups as well as council members, especially because the council members have a role in the process. We ultimately we have to make determinations on merit, but if something is meritorious, that support is very very helpful to us. Okay, thank you, Chair Salmanca. I want to um, just give um, Chair Cato 30 seconds uh, to ask his last question. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, have you had occasion to uh, read this uh, story in the New York Times, the, yes. uh, the, the radical priest versus uh, the private school involving uh, basically what is a uh, remnant of an old orphanage from my district from the 1800s that was revealed my understanding is that the LPC and the landmark standards does not protect items like these. That, that is what I was advised by my local historic organization, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Is, there, is it something worth considering that perhaps we might want to start working with the standards so that uh, as buildings are being developed that we're able to say, you know what, even though they uh, that, that there are parts of the building that are worth landmarking and remembering, or is, is it just the, star, the, the cold hard truth that no, no matter what the story and how compelling the story is and how New York Times worthy the story is, uh, it's yeah. still just not a landmark. There are really kind of two parts to that answer. And the first is, is that you know, we regulate entire units of property when we designate them, and so um, a a building, so in this case, the building itself to which this fragment is attached or integrated in is the building itself does not meet the criteria for designation. Um, but even if it did, the Landmarks, this Landmarks Commission has no jurisdiction of, over construction on properties adjacent to landmarks. So there is no way under the Landmarks Law that we can protect the view of a side wall if a new building is constructed next to a landmark. Thank you. Um, my last uh, round of questions. 
when will you uh, when will your agency provide this committee with the breakdown of how that uh, that money for personal services a half a million dollars we, is we useful? can do that quickly we'll okay. get that back to you quickly all right um, what type of outreach is your agency doing for this uh, historic preservation grants I, I just find it hard to believe that only 12 applicants in the city yeah as big as ours applied. I know, we, we, we are actively seeking people, seeking uh, uh, applicants, and we H how, do- How, um, how exactly? Because I never see you in yeah, my community. We do targeted mailings. We have, as again, starting last fall, we have increased the number of sessions. We actually did do a session that you uh, partnered with us on a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was a few years ago, yeah. at my request. And yes, and we have, um, I think we actually are heading to the Bronx again this Mott Haven in the next couple of months. So um, we are happy to work with any of you if you would like us to come out into your community. Chair, in the last three fiscal years, actually, before I get there, well, no. In the last three fiscal years, how much of that um, historic preservation grant funding was given back to OMB? We have a dollar amount there. I don't have a dollar amount. We can get that to you, but I think in um, most years we are we use the entire money. There have been a couple of years where well, it's been fiscal year eighteen, uh, you use ninety five thousand dollars. All right. Fiscal year. Let's do the math here. Fiscal year eighteen. Okay, so there is about fifteen to twenty thousand each year that we don't use. This year, we um, because we have two applications pending, we still have some money reserved for that. Um, but should those not work out and they don't meet the eligibility requirements, we would like to return to the three applicants who have already been awarded grants to try to increase the amount given to them so that we do use the entire amount. So fiscal year. So my math, raw math there, between fiscal year 17 and 18, there were $47,326 that was given back to OMB. What does OMB do with that money? I don't know what they do. I mean, it's, it's a question. It's, it's for city use, and I think it, but, OMB. But that money is giving specifically to, to, to the city geared towards your agency uh, for landmarks. So if, if you're not utilizing that money, what is OMB doing with that funding? How are they justifying that with the federal government? So the, the money is given to the city and the city allocates the money to us and therefore if it isn't used, then they reallocate it. I, I think beyond that, I, it's an OMB question. I just think that whatever money that OMB allocates for this, um, for this grant opportunity, um, if that money is being given back to OMB because these homeowners are not falling under whatever the criteria that is required by HUD, maybe the city with that funding should create its own grant funding and create its own criteria to try to help out those families that don't qualify to see how we can help them. It, I just, it, it just baffles me that 12, only 12 applicants applied and in this fiscal year there are only three. Um, I, I just, mm, it yeah. just doesn't sit right with me. All right, with that, um, I want to thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have um, Council Member Traeger who has some questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, I, I again, just uh, I do appreciate LPC working with us to finally uh, landmark the boardwalk, and, and, and I'm truly appreciative of that. Um, I just, I do have a quick question on, this This just came to my attention recently, so I, yeah. I'm just warning this and just wanted to flag this for LPC. Um, so I think you're familiar with uh, Charles Denson, Coney Island History Project. Um, he posted something on his social media that I don't know if, if it got to your attention, that the, uh, the Grasshorn Building in Coney Island, which apparently according to him is the Coney Island's oldest structure still standing, um, owned by Joe State of Thor Equities, and the Buildings Department uh, granted Thor Equities a demolition permit on January 23rd, 2019. No heads up to my office or to anyone really in the community. Um, does the Buildings Department check in at all with LPC 
about any potential historical structures before a demo permit is issued. I mean, this is the last oldest structure st still standing in Coney. Right. I'm not sure, were you aware of this uh, prior? I, I was not aware of it, no. But the Department of Buildings does have a process where <coughs> they, before they issue a demolition permit, they um, require applicants to submit documentation showing the building is not a landmark and not currently calendared for consideration. So there is that check, but if it's something that hasn't been calendared, um, or no, but that's for all buildings, I should say. So, but there's a so there's a status letter that it's not landmarked and not calendared. So we do have an opportunity to look at, at items when they ask for that. Um, but this one I, I am not aware of. Right. Maybe if we could just follow up with your office after after sure. this hearing. I mean, it's I just learned of this myself, and knows we really know heads up to the community. And this was a part of a contentious, you know. Thor Equities went through a contentious rezoning in 09, and there was promises about to revitalize this area, not to demolish this area. Um, and so I would like to follow up with your office afterwards. Certainly, we'll follow thank up. You. With thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. I want to thank you, Chair, for you, you and your team for coming here today, and we look forward to more uh, conversations Great. on some of our questions. Up next, uh, we will have uh, the Department of uh, City Planning here. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, um, and welcome uh, to today's hearing of the Land Use Committee. I am Council Member Rafael Salamanca, and I am the chair of the committee. Today we will examine the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2019 preliminary mayor's management report for the Department of City Planning.
Before we start, I would like to recognize my colleagues who are joining us today. We have uh, Chair Adams, Chair Moya, and Chair Kalos. We present, we also have Council Member Reynoso, Kalos, Miller, Chair Adams, Council Member Gibson, and Chair Kalos. This hearing will review the Department of City Planning's proposed 45.8 million fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. While this figure appears small in the context of the city's overall budget, city planning is about redefining our collective future as a city, so it's worth spending a little extra time on it today. Our questions will not only address the particulars in this year's budget, but the overall approach to the city's planning in New York City and whether we are resourced to do the work we need to do. Broadly, significant and serious questions have been raised by this council about the current practice of selecting only a handful of neighborhoods and engaging in a continuous, years-long individual planning process as our primary mode of accommodating growth. Without comprehensively addressing the needs of the entire city, New York has allowed decades-old regulations to remain in place in many neighborhoods. In my district, for example, much of the zoning is R6 and R7, unchanged since 1961, allowing a broad zoning of mid to high density development regardless of the local character of neighborhoods. Some of these areas have single family homes, some have small historic row houses, and others have larger apartment buildings, but all have the same planning thinking from the early 1960s. How is that possible in a city as dynamic as New York City that neighborhoods like my district and many others still operate with a version of the future expressed by planners from the early 1960s? What if we tolerated that approach in healthcare? Some neighborhoods get the care and technology a doctor in 1961 would provide and others get modern thinking? In the council's report to the Charter Revision Commission, we included numerous recommendations for improving the planning process in New York. Most prominently, a potential framework for the creation of a comprehensive plan developed with community level participation and with the clear guidelines to accommodate the city's projected growth and infrastructure needs. Such a plan would serve as a foundation for both public and private development decisions and a framework for updating and maintaining the zoning map and zoning text for contemporary needs. We look forward to advancing the conversation about how the city's land use and planning process can be improved with the Charter Revision Commission and working with DCP in the interim to collectively deliver better outcomes for all New Yorkers. I emphasize collective because without meaningful partnerships, very little of substance can be accomplished in planning. And I hope we can find a way in the remaining two years and nine months of this administration to build those partnerships. I would like to thank the director and chair of the Department of City Planning, Marissa Lago, and Anita Larman, Susan R. Amran, and John Kaufman for joining us today. I look forward to a robust conversation about ways in which we can improve on how we plan for our city. But I know and understand very well that the work you do is hard, and I would like to thank you for doing it. So will the committee staff Please swear in the panel. Before responding, um, please make sure your mic is on and state your name into the mic. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Marisa Lago, yes. Anita Lermont, yes. John Kaufman. John Kaufman, yes. Susan Amron, yes. Well, good afternoon, Chair Salamanca and subcommittee chairs Moya, Adams, and Kalos, and also all distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to discuss the Department of City Planning's, I'll probably end up using the acronym DCP's, preliminary FY 2020 budget. And thank you especially, Chair Salamanca, for noting that we are tiny but mighty at city planning. Uh, before turning to the budget, I'd like to touch upon a few critical topics, transparency, training, and the 2020 census. City planning continues to develop and make available for absolutely free, easy to use digital planning tools. These sophisticated tools are made for the public, for residents, students, businesses, and elected officials. They're meant to increase public fluency in New York City's complicated 
land use review process. They allow the public to explore, understand, and navigate land use rules. They put demographic and socioeconomic information at people's fingertips. Since I appeared before you last March, city planning has released 10 separate digital tools. The most recent release is a first ever interactive digital version of our zoning resolution. Having this green formatted zoning resolution means that we will no longer have to be printing the 1500 plus page document. This digital edition empowers the public which no longer will have to pay $750 to get a hard copy of the zoning resolution, making it much more readily accessible. A complete list of city planning's tools that we launched in the last 12 months is attached as an appendix to my written testimony. We've also made significant progress in increasing and improving training for community boards. At the request of this committee, City Planning launched a series of training sessions to better engage with both new and more experienced community board members. These DCP workshops aim to strengthen community boards by providing consistent and ongoing training on fundamental planning principles. They also assure that community board members are aware of the many data and planning resources and tools that are available to them for free through the Department of City Planning. This past year, in coordination with all five borough president's offices, each DCP borough office provided training to new community board members, reaching approximately 235 community board participants, with the vast majority of community boards being represented by at least one person. In addition, DCP has already hosted two leadership forums for community board chairs and district managers, Nearly half of all boards were represented at these forums. And we did a poll, an exit poll, and 84% of those who attended stated that they'd recommend the training to their colleagues. So we'll be holding yet another session. I wanna thank this committee. Last year, you asked us for more uh, training. We've responded robustly, and we're very pleased with the results. Um, I would be remiss if I did not use absolutely every public occasion to emphasize the importance of a full, accurate 2020 census count. The decennial census, census count directly affects federal funding for many programs that are critical to the well-being of New Yorkers. Because the funding is based on our population, we must have an accurate count in 2020. The members of DCP's population division are renowned experts in counting urban areas. Their expertise was on view in the New York State Attorney General's lawsuit challenging the US Census Bureau's decision to include a citizenship question on the 2020 census. Among the nationally recognized expert witnesses who were called to testify in the case was the city's chief demographer, DCP's own Joseph Salvo. As part of DCP's work to get a full count in next year's census, Dr. Salvo and his team submitted addresses for more than 122,000 housing units that the Federal Census Bureau didn't have on their address list. Overlooked addresses are frequently inhabited by vulnerable and underrepresented populations. Finding these addresses means that about 300,000 more New Yorkers can now be counted. I'll end with the topic of this hearing, the budget. DCP began fiscal year 19 with an adopted budget of 52 million and an authorized headcount of 355 full-time positions. 31 million and 164 positions are funded with city tax levy dollars and the remaining 21 million and 191 positions are funded primarily by grant awards from the federal government. Another way of looking at the 52 million adopted budget it allocates 30 million to personnel services and 22 million to OTPS, other than personnel services. In comparison to the FY19 adopted, our FY20 preliminary budget of 45.8 million and 379 full-time positions represents a net reduction of $6.2 million and a 24 position increase to our operating budget. This $6.2 million decrease is the combination of a $2.6 million increase in personal services and 
8.9 million net decrease in OTPS funding. This variance of 6.2 million is driven primarily by the expiration of several one-time temporary projects, and it's offset by supplemental funding for collective bargaining increases and some minor new needs. In the interest of getting to your questions on agency programming and agency policy, I won't go into the detail around every 100,000 that is part of our adjustments, although it is contained in our written testimony, and if the committee would prefer through its questioning, I would be glad to, again, go through it in painstaking details. I'll just sum up by noting that the mayor's FY20 preliminary budget adequately supports city planning's robust work program. I should make that very robust work program, allowing us to meet the needs and expectations of New Yorkers. So thank you for inviting us to testify, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chair, for your, um, for your testimony. My, um, my first round of questions will go towards the Euler process, the land use application process. This process takes about seven months to complete, but often takes years for an application to get to the Euler. This administration has approximately two years and nine months left. Can you give us a list of the priority projects for completing in that time frame? Certainly, we have quite an ambitious list of projects that we are looking to have get through ULERP during this administration. Um, it starts with Bay Street, which is actually going, um, is in post-CPC hearing review. Um, we agreed as part of the East Harlem rezoning to a follow-up action, and that is now actively in the Euler process. Um, we have a provision, um, a proposed text amendment on mechanical voids, which again is headed towards a public hearing before the City Planning Commission. Um, we have in scoping um, the pre euler process of preparing the environmental impact statement a text amendment dealing with special, nat special natural resource districts. This affects Staten Island and portions of the Bronx. Um, we have work underway looking at North Brooklyn industrial area. As you had mentioned, much of our zoning has remained unchanged since 1961, and that is particularly true of M manufacturing districts. Um, we are looking at Gowanus. We have um, issued a framework working very closely with Council Members Lander and Levin. Um, we are working with Council Member Reynoso on a rezoning of Bushwick. Um, the list continues. This is a bit further out. These are projects that won't be until next year um, entering certification. That includes zoning for resiliency. This is an updating of the zoning that we put in place immediately following Superstorm Sandy. We are looking at the areas around the four new Metro North stations in the Bronx to determine whether the land use, whether the zoning around those stations um, makes sense in light of the new transit access. Um, we are also in your district and working closely with you um, looking at Southern Boulevard to see how we can capitalize on the state's investment to um, make that boulevard more, if not pedestrian friendly, at least easier to cross and get access to the waterfront. And then in addition, we are working very closely with Council Member Chin and Borough President Brewer to look at the land use in Soho and NoHo. All right, um, can your office provide us with a list Gladly. All right. I want to talk about the uh, neighborhood rezonings and the studies. Has uh, DCP conducted any studies to look at the effects of previous rezonings on low-income residents in and around the rezoning areas? It's very hard to look at impacts on individuals. Privacy considerations make that a challenge. I'd also note that the rezonings at this point are at their oldest, three years old, and rezonings take place over time. Um, the impacts of them are taking place over time. 
but we are actually working closely with HPD to see how we can monitor, um, anticipate, and put in place tools as neighborhoods change over time. You know, the previous neighborhoods rezoned have, well, the previous neighborhood rezonings that have been conducted have been predominantly in communities of color. East New York, Jerome, Inwood, East Harlem, Far Rockaways, and there's a study happening in my community. And the main concern that we have is gentrification, displacement of individuals that have lived there for decades. Do you believe that the city-led neighborhood rezoning initiatives have targeted minority communities? No. But we Commissioner, <laughs> East New York, Jerome, Inwood, East Harlem, Far Rockaway are all communities of color. If, if I could, Chair, I'd like to explain how we select neighborhoods. Yes. And it is very dependent on requests coming from the communities. In each of the neighborhoods that we have rezoned and ones that are currently underway in that work program that I laid out, we have been approached by a combination of community boards. That would be the case um, in Council Member Gibson's district where two Bronx community boards came forward and asked us to rezone. They were then joined by a, um, a third community board. So a combination of community boards, borough presidents, individual council members. We know that the key to a successful rezoning to address our housing crisis is a couple of things. One is transit access. Um, in much of the rest of the nation, people like love to use the term TOD, transit-oriented development. We don't use it in New York because that is just the essence of how we grow. Another element, though, is the buy-in of the council member, a willingness to start down this path. We are very pleased that council members Lander and Levin have asked us, have been such strong partners in looking at Gowanus, um, a neighborhood where the AMI is well above the city average. We would welcome other council members who would come forward and ask to partner with us to look at their neighborhoods. Another piece of the equation is the private applications that are taking place. We routinely process private applications for upzonings that result in MIH being triggered. Perhaps the most significant one that I would highlight is on the block directly south of Hudson Yards. Two landowners own two-thirds of that block. The council approved a rezoning from an M zoning, again, an outdated M zoning from 1961, to high density residential that was compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. And without any city discretionary subsidy, they are producing hundreds of units of permanently affordable housing in one of the city's very wealthy neighborhoods. Commissioner. Um, when you are doing, when your agency is performing these studies, and are you looking at potential gentrification or displacement of communities? Is there an environment, when you do your environmental impact study, is there a study on gentrification or displacement? Yes, that is one of the categories that is called for to be looked at in the seeker manual. Council member, I realize that I did not address a portion of um, your earlier question with respect to the concerns about gentrification when there is a rezoning underway. I think it is a, a critical part of our neighborhood rezonings are the neighborhood plan that precedes the rezoning because there's a recognition that uh, certainly we at City Planning recognize that zoning is a powerful tool, but it is not the only tool available to the city. And so an integral part of our neighborhood planning process is working with HPD and being able to deploy their full suite of tools, be it a certificate of no harassment policy, um, be it a focus on preservation of existing affordable housing, be it providing um, legal, free legal services to tenants 
who require them. And so that's part of the entire packet, not just the rezoning alone. Commissioner, you know, the main, one of the concerns that communities of color, at least my community, um, that I'm hearing from the Southern Boulevard study is the amount of, it's easy, it's easy for us to negotiate and rezone a city-owned land where we can ensure that there will be 100% affordable housing. It, it, it's, it's just much easier for us. Opposed to a vacant lot that's been sitting there dormant for decades by a private owner because they do not want to go through the process of the rezoning because it could be expensive. But yet here comes the city which will rezone that piece of property for them. And in essence, council members will lose that power. Our power is the power to be able to rezone, to be able to negotiate. And in essence, we're taking that piece of land, we are requiring MIH, which in some cases may be 30% of that, of that, of that uh, development be affordable forever. But the other 70% they can charge whatever rent they choose to. And so the concern that I hear in my communities is if this property owner sat on that on this piece of land for 10 years, what is, not, what is stopping him from not sitting on this piece of land for another five years, sell it to a deep pocket developer who can come in and give that community the bare minimum of MIH and come in and bring in above market rate? See, these communities of color are transit rich. My community is transit rich. And so there's major concern where there are areas where we should be down zoning to protect the character of neighborhoods. As part of the study, the options that's being presented by city planning is up zoning. With respect, Chair, all of our neighborhood rezonings have had up zoning components typically on the blocks closest to mass transit, which are the areas that can best handle the density, and then preservation, down zoning, of areas of the neighborhood that are further from transit, that are on the mid blocks, that have an established lower scale character. And so we have that balance of up zoning in areas that we believe can handle the up zoning, that can handle the density, and provide housing that's needed for a growing city with significant preservation components. Um, Chair, what are the benefits of, of the rezonings for those communities? In each, um, in each of the rezonings, it is a, it, it's not a cookie cutter. It's not, okay, here's the rezoning, here's what you get. The benefits vary based on what we have heard through the two and a half to three years of planning that generally proceed, um, based on recommendations from the community board, and ultimately based on what the council member has identified as priorities. Um, if we look at the East Harlem rezoning, one of the most significant needs that was identified there was repairing the waterfront giving this dense neighborhood better access to the waterfront. Um, as Councilmember Gibson will certainly know, in the rezoning of Jerome Avenue, the need for parks was identified, and so there was both the addition of parkland and significant capital investments in parks. Um, what we can do, it's, it's uh, tracked pr publicly by the Mayor's Office of Operation, is give you a, a list of what the capital improvements are. Chair, so, you know, and, and that's interesting because East Harlem, their waterfront needed to be redone. Jerome Avenue, they needed these parks, yep. right? Because the city knew they needed these parks. Um, and as, as part of my study, I'm asking for a list of capital needs for schools, a capital needs for parks. There's major in, trans, transportation infrastructure that is needed, but that's the responsibility of the city why should a community have to be rezoned for the city to do their job and invest those capital dollars where they're needed? Why is it that they're, you know, hanging a carrot over us saying, we will give you a park that you need. We will fix that intersection that you need. We'll, act, we'll add that traffic light that you need, but allow us to build higher with potential of gentrification and displacement. I would address that in a couple of dimensions, Chair. 
The first is that we are dealing with a legacy of disinvestment in these communities by prior administrations. That is, I think, undebatable. And it is the responsibility of the city to deploy its capital budget to address the needs citywide, and that is what we are doing. The improvements, the amenities, the um, both capital and non-capital expenditures that come along with a rezoning are in addition to the underlying work programs of our city's capital agencies. Um, we are proud that when we identify neighborhoods that are transit rich and that do have the opportunity to produce more housing, that we are able as part of the rezoning to assess the needs and to provide special emphasis, to provide more than what would perhaps otherwise have resulted from a citywide budgeting process. And so we're unapologetic about bringing additional resources to bear. I, I think that these resources should be added to communities without asking these communities to, um, to create more density and, and add potential for displacement. Um, with that, I'm gonna go to some of the questions of some of the chairs that I have here. So we're gonna go with the, uh, the chair of zoning, um, uh, Chair Moya. We're gonna give the chairs five minutes and then we're going to give the, the council members three minutes. Thank you, um, Chairman, and, and thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. Um, when it comes to sort of staffing and planning, uh, how many of the current uh, 381 uh, staff at DCP are actual urban planners? There are 195 urban planners, but what I would want to note is that we have a general counsel's office of 14 who are all expert land use lawyers. I would also note that many people, while not trained as planners, have dedicated their careers to planning. And I would note that while none of us here on the dais has a planning degree, we operate as sophisticated planners based on our professional experience. Okay, and how many of, of, of those are assigned uh, to each borough office? We have 95 planners in our borough offices. What th those planners are supplemented by subject matter planning experts that we have at our headquarters. And it ranges from people with expertise in housing planning, um, in waterfront and open space planning, regional planning, and these resources are made available to our borough offices. I should also note we have a division focused um, on zoning, on the intricacies of drafting zoning text, another on urban design, another on transportation, and so these planners supplement the work of our borough offices. Okay, so do you believe that uh, you have enough urban planners to carry out your mission with those numbers? Yes, we have an ambitious mission, but we feel properly resourced. Um, and what do you say to communities and numerous elected officials uh, who feel that their voices are not heard in the planning process? Uh, I have, and with that, I've also have suggested that uh, each community board be given uh, an urban planner uh, to help navigate the complex world of city land use. Uh, I brought this up last year uh, and just want to know what progress uh, has been made, uh, if any, uh, on, on that. I agree um, that we benefit when community boards choose to use their budget to invest in planning resources. Uh, they're better able to, to represent their community, to make salient suggestions for improving projects that are going through the land use review or to participate in planning studies. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we are very pleased that last year this committee pointed out the fact that we needed to up our game when it came to training community board members. And as a result, we have done sessions in each of the boroughs. In addition, we have held sessions at our headquarters because some members of even 
um, who live in boroughs outside of Manhattan work in Manhattan and indicated that it would be easier to have the sessions at our headquarters. We intend to continue this. We focused initially on new board members as the highest priority. We then moved on to the community board chairs and the district managers. And this year we are expanding the program and opening it up to any community board members. So someone may have been on the community board for a while and might appreciate a refresher course. The one thing that I would note is if it, would ever, if it ever would be helpful, we would welcome the participation of any of the members of your team who might be interested. Great. Uh, I, I, I just, if the, the chair could indulge me, I just have two questions and I just wanna uh, make sure I can get them in. Uh, when it deals to the uh, unpredictable buildings, uh, in, in recent years, uh, there has been a rise in the number of what we call unpredictable buildings. Uh, these are buildings that are surprisingly tall or large uh, for a neighborhood. Uh, many of these buildings are a result of zoning lot mergers, as you know, uh, and these are when two properties are merged uh, in order to transfer development rights from one property uh, to the other. Uh, for example, a developer could purchase a one-story uh, commercial building next to a church, uh, execute a zoning lot merger with the church, uh, transfer the church church's development rights uh, to their site, and all of a sudden a new development that is much taller uh, than anyone in the neighborhood uh, has known uh, to be possible comes through. Um, does DCP have any way of knowing about these mergers and foreseeing how uh, they will be used before the developers uh, record, uh, record a zoning lot uh, development agreement uh, when filing with the building's permit? I'd note that this ability to subdivide and merge zoning lots is a fundamental property right that we believe underpins our approach to land use. Um, currently, there is not, it is quite difficult to figure out by going through the records when the zoning lot mergers have occurred, and we would very much welcome having a system, perhaps through the, a filing with the Department of Finance, so that it would bring more transparency to the process. Great, and just my last question, if that's okay. Uh, I know that, uh, and, and maybe this was, was asked before, but uh, how often does uh, uh, DCP help facilitate uh, conversations about public and private partnerships uh, with the MTA regarding transit improvements, specifically around transit accessibility? You know, as, as the chair of zoning, we've seen two examples uh, lately, and one, of course, as uh, we know, uh, Chairman Salamanca had, had mentioned, I think, before, but one in the Bronx and one in lower Manhattan. Uh, is more funding needed to make these conversations happen more often? Uh, and if you can just el elaborate with, with that a little bit more, that would be helpful. Thank you for raising that because transit accessibility is a passion of mine. Um, we are in, I don't know how to emphasize strongly enough how frequent contact with the MTA looking for opportunities for accessibility. I am very proud of the fact that using a zoning mechanism, we were able to, with the one Vanderbilt project, make additional portions of the Grand Central Transit complex more accessible. The other project that you mentioned was 85 Broad Street here in Lower Manhattan. And by taking advantage of a special permit, we were able to bring, well, it's still being constructed, we will be bringing transit accessibility to the terminus of the J and the Z line. So important to be able to bring people with mobility challenges to work in the heart of the financial district. And again, that was without public subsidy. We've seen in two of our zonings, um, the looking forward, the planning aspect of it, requiring developers who have sites that could be the location of expansions of our subway system in East Harlem, for instance, being required before they develop to consult with the MTA about whether there is the need to reserve an easement for future accessibility. Um, we, again, we work with the MTA whenever there is a project that is adjacent to our station, to a station. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have uh, questions from Chair Kalos. 
Uh, it's good to see you, Chair Lago. Uh, my understanding is you have a background in physics. Uh, do you know the subject of today's Google Doodle? It proudly honors a Russian female mathematician whose contributions are still being felt today in our weather forecasting ability. Uh, does that mean one day the weather forecast will be right, like on Monday? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, last year at the executive budget hearing, I asked whether you are on track for a zoning text amendment to close the loop on voids. You met your target. Thank you. Uh, when your report focused on residential districts, I joined with our borough president, Gail Brewer, and our speaker, Corey Johnson, to ask that you include commercial special districts in Midtown and the finance district. Are you on track for June? We anticipate that we will be able to refer out an amendment um, addressing the very different conditions in central business districts at some point this summer. So that's June or July, or is that July, August? Again, I am not, I don't want to misstate, but we are working assiduously on it. As you can imagine, central business districts present a very different profile than do high density residential districts. I read in Gothamist that Raphael Van Yoli, who designed 432 Park, and also incidentally designed uh, 249 East 62nd Street, which is referred to either as the Barbell Building or the Jetsons Building, uh, was getting around the zoning text amendment that you had prepared by simply converting their building from having a mechanical void to just popping the walls off so that it's on stilts. Uh, will DCP be looking at uh, this new loophole uh, as you look at your summer text amendment? We don't intend to, uh, we don't intend to address that. We um, are focusing on where we have seen actual challenges, which we believe, which is why we focused on mechanical voids in high density residential districts. Where we haven't seen stilts being abused, um, where we see stilts, a perfect example, which I believe is also in your district, is the city um, the city group building the it's, one with the beautiful angle it, it's the just stilts a, there are to protect a landmark church right so so yeah it's not it's just outside my district it's an area i enjoy i think i would distinguish between a building that uses height to protect a landmark church and actually the building meets with a plaza, a public plaza and shopping center with a beautiful glassed in area for the public and a public use and then you have an enhanced subway entrance that I believe is accessible uh, below. So I guess I would distinguish the 53rd Street Citibank building which incidentally uh, was not designed properly given different wind forces and is currently being redesigned and the, the architect has been uh, the subject of quite con some controversy there, between space that creates public usable activation space mm -hmm. versus stilts that are, are quite cynically so in the middle of a building to do nothing more than give folks, uh, per perhaps billionaires, a, a better view. So I guess I would ask that you reconsider. I will continue to advocate that uh, if somebody tries to get away the away around the mechanical voids, uh, amendment by simply popping the walls off, uh, that you would seriously consider it. As the chair of the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions, we're engaged in preservation and constructions of buildings that more often than not have no accessibility. And one of the situations I have in my district where a lot of my, a lot of my units are actually in the mid block. Uh, the majority of my units are in the mid block and RAB in four, five, and six story walk-ups. And uh, those apartments are, uh, the, the, once the people age, and all of us are gonna age, and as we age, uh, unless you are blessed in a way that I am not, uh, your, your body starts to break down, you become less and less able, people become shut-ins. And so it's very disheartening that we're spending billions on preservation for apartments that won't be accessible to the tenants, let alone if they have anyone in their family who does it, and then, there's occasions like becoming temporarily disabled, that is the term used for pregnancy, uh, where it's something that happens to a lot of women and families in their lives where folks may not be able to get up five or six stories, especially when there's complications. So uh, would DCP be able to, and do you have sufficient budgeting to investigate perhaps a special permit for 100% affordable housing to add 
elevators and relax building envelopes and setback requirements to get that without losing the valuable FAR for affordable housing. I'd actually welcome continuing the conversation because as you're describing the four, five, and six story walk-ups, I am literally wincing um, because I now have a beautiful pain-free titanium knee, but went for years with every step being agony. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. Um, up next, we have uh, Chair Adams. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Welcome, Chair Lago. It's a pleasure to see you today. Uh, I represent portions of Southeast Queens where we've had uh, We've had uh, zoning over the past few years also. We also have an influx of building hotels um, in the areas. So much like uh, um, my colleague's question earlier, Chair Salamanca's question earlier, regarding uh, DCP's studies to take a look at the effects of previous uh, rezonings in certain area areas, have there been any um, studies by DCP on previous rezonings in Southeast Queens, particularly um, as it um, reflects on uh, the infrastructure and the impact on infrastructure? Committee Chair, could you, um, which particular rezonings are you referring to? Speaking about uh, Jamaica area, specifically? I don't believe so. I'd welcome following up with you about what the concern right. is. I have not heard that before. Great, okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna move to another area. I'm gonna be um, pretty quickly. I'm a former chair of a community board, Community Board 12, uh, and I know that your partnership with Community Board 12, uh, community boards in general, you take very seriously, and I appreciate that. Um, how is DCP involved in the recently passed charter revision to establish the Civic Engagement Commission? We are not involved. Not at all? No, I would refer, um, I would refer you to Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson. It is he who is taking the lead. Okay, um, we'll do that. All right, my, my last question is going to pertain to um, MIH, um, which um, was created in 2016 uh, as a tool to be applied in new rezonings. The old voluntary inclusionary housing tools were left in place where they existed. In the previous budget hearing, you committed to reviewing the VIH program. Can you provide an update on that and the timeline on when to expect the changes to the program? Yes, um, we have been working with council staff on that, and we absolutely agree that when developers are given a floor area bonus and other incentives like a tax exemption, the result should achieve more affordability. Now, what I am pleased that HPD has already enacted new rules to prohibit the use of 421A units to generate off-site bonus. That was the double dipping um, that had been of concern before, and so that loophole has been closed. Fantastic. I will just close with saying that we're so glad you're here. <laughs> thank you, and I also want to thank you in particular. Last year, I think you were perhaps um, the strongest critic of the training that we were providing to community boards. Probably. And it was, it was a wake-up call in which we went back and realized that we were, it, it wasn't consistent across the city. And so in addition to the number of trainings, we are very proud of the materials that we have put together um, and are this next year the fact that we can offer it to all community board members is a testament to your questioning, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. Uh, up next, we have Council Member Reynoso. Welcome, DCP. Hello, Chair. Uh, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Does the North Brooklyn study contemplate the inclusion of residential uses in the study area be beyond bringing residential buildings that predate the city's zoning code into compliance? No. Um, Currently, the city is, from what I understand, vocally in support of the loft law. And I wanted to ask how uh, the loft law falls in line with your, your, uh, your presentation or study related to the IBZ, considering that there's no residential development suggested, but the city seems to support the loft law, which is looking for to legalize conversions from manufacturing to residential. It's a tough one. In a city that is growing 
growing both in terms of population and number of jobs, and at an all-time high in population, we have to look for all opportunities for housing. At the same time, we recognize that IBZs are a resource consciously set up to preserve industrial jobs. Um, we have heard of ongoing conversations in which you have been a leader and look forward to seeing how they play out. Uh, can I expect the city to be a partner in my conversations that I'm having with the state related to the law of law that the IBZs should be protected and that manufacturing jobs are extremely important to our future. I'd refer you to the deputy mayor on that. So the deputy mayor ultimately makes the decision related to a land use issue, not, not DCP. No, not with respect to a land use issue, but with respect to the applicability of the law flaw, which exists alongside land uses. So even though it, it, it contradicts uh, your position in the protection of manufacturing, in a study that you spent countless years and money on, uh, ultimately you defer to your deputy mayor uh, to make these, I guess, policy decisions on, on land use? Yes, council member, because again, there are competing uses. There is rarely a land use decision that is made that doesn't have to balance competing equities. As you know, we have been partners with you and are continuing to be on North Brooklyn. Our commitment to that precious IBZ, I don't think can be questioned. At the same time, the law floor is there for a very legitimate reason. And as you know better than anyone, there are very strongly held arguments on both sides. I want to disagree. Um, your support is not um, strong. I want to be clear, this is one of the only IBZs out of 16 in the city of New York that were included in the law flaw. And how this uh, doesn't uh, constitute uh, a, what I, want to what I want to say, an exception um, is beyond me how the city would go and support the law flaw in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I just want to state that if you're going to be supportive, then be supportive. Uh, this hypocritical uh, working both sides it, it is not helpful to good planning. Um, and if you're saying there's competing interests, uh, the IBZs were specifically created to, to ensure that there are no competing interests and that the city has a clear policy as to where, where its support is thrown. Um, and because my time is up, just, you know, like a lot of these underinvested communities and the lack of rezoning that's happened or the lack of changes in a lot of these zoning in these communities re related to zoning since 1961, I would also state that there's been uh, very few to no changes in the uh, uh, in DCP or the Department of City Planning since the 1980s. And I also think that uh, as we look to uh, deal with antiquated zoning in our city, we think about uh, changing the operations and how exactly DCP does its work because maybe that needs some changes as well. Thank you. Chair, uh, just to piggyback on Antonio's question, um, you serve as the chair of city planning and also as the department, as, a, as the um, director of city planning. Why do you, do you think, what do you, do you think that there's value in serving in a dual role as a CPC chair and DCP uh, um, director? Tremendous value. Now, is your board independent of the mayor? Absolutely. But you just mentioned that the deputy mayor is making policy decisions and you referred certain questions over to the deputy mayor that city planning should be you know, taking a stance on. These aren't land use decisions. The law flaw is a separate provision. If I might elaborate on the dual, on the dual nature, um, it is a structure that many other cities envy because of the ability of the commission to provide very helpful input into the work of the department and for the department to make available to the commission the tremendous expertise that we have. I particularly highlight an example of the commission making the department, making the city better. Um, we have seen over the two years that I've been here a steady stream of lease renewals for ACS and DIFTA facilities, the child care and elder care centers. One can look at them and say, these are non-controversial, routine, 
matters that go through ULERP. They're generally facilities that are beloved by their community and well used. Um, we had two of our commissioners, one was a mayoral appointee, one was a borough president appointee, who started expressing concern about the fact that at the time of lease renewal, we weren't requiring sprinkling in buildings where the populations are vulnerable because of age at either end of the spectrum. And through these commissioners' advocacy, um, there was a marked turnaround by ACS and DIFTA in negotiating, and DCAS I should mention as well, in negotiating scopes of work as part of the renewal that are providing more and more sprinklered facilities. Another three commissioners, in this instance, two borough president appointees and one mayoral, became concerned with the drab appearance of many of these facilities. Many of them have been leased to, um, for childcare and senior care centers since the early 70s. Um, the, many of the buildings look like boxes. They're from an era where not having small windows with bars made people feel safer. Um, we worked, the department worked with our urban design team to put in place a menu of low cost options for making these centers more welcoming, both to the children and elders who go there, but also to the community. Suggestions for muraling, for uh, clear signage at the entries. Many of these facilities have um, metal chain link fences on the roof for the play area and of weaving pieces of plastic into some bright design. And again, it's a, a small way in which the combination of the commission and the department working together are making these facilities throughout our city so much better. All right, thank you. Um, up next, we have Council Member Gibson for questions. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, and to all of our uh, subcommittee chairs. Good afternoon, Chair. Good to see you and the entire DCP team. And I know in your earlier remarks, you mentioned that uh, upon many of the neighborhood rezonings that come to DCP, many of them are propelled by elected officials and or community boards. Um, so I know you made a lot of reference to the Jerome neighborhood plan, but this council member did not make that recommendation for Jerome. Um, my community boards have been working on a number of different uh, options like 197A plans for many, many years before I got to the council. Um, and in my three years of putting together the Jerome working with Council Member Cabrera, I learned a lot. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Uh, and for the remainder of my term, it's going to carry me through the end here, just making sure that DCP and all of the relevant agencies make sure that all of the components we agree to are actually implemented. So I want to thank you for recognizing the legislation that was codified that provides the capital commitment tracker. Uh, we are looking collectively as a council because right now we don't have a capital tracker for City of New York capital projects. We have you. We have SCA and a few other agencies, but there's no system today to track actual capital projects. So that brings me to my question. Um, I chair the subcommittee on capital, so we've been looking at the mayor's 10-year capital strategy, which is about 108 point one billion dollars. Uh, DCP was very involved in working with OMB on crafting the capital strategy, but one of the things that we recognized in the capital strategy was the first five years of the capital account for 70 percent of the entire plan strategy. The front section of the strategy, which details the policies, the goals, connect to the back of the strategy, which actually lists all the funding by agencies. But what we recognize is that since most of the funding are in the front years and not in the latter years, what one would assume as an example, SCA, just as an example, their five-year capital plan, it would assume that after five years, there's no longer a need for more school seats in the city of New York that's growing. So my question to DCP is your role with OMB in crafting the capital strategy, and what is the logic and the mechanism behind a 10-year capital strategy whose majority of the funding is in the first few years in terms of front-loading and not making sure that it's more layered, which would be a more reflective, um, accurate presentation of how much we spend every year agency by agency. Could you give us a little bit of insight in how you develop the capital strategy? No, gladly. and. Um 
this will be my, I, I've been impressed to see the traction that city planning is gaining year over year on its input into the 10-year capital strategy. If you'll note in this year's document, we have laid out four guiding principles. Um, those principles are to be used by all of the capital agencies, and it reflect, reflects a lens, including equity, um, including fiscal sustainability, through which all capital decisions are made. Um, the architect of city planning's engagement with OMB and of the 10-year capital strategy is John Kaufman, our chief operating officer. And if I could, I would turn it over for, to him to elaborate. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Uh, and I appreciate your attention to this topic and, and your newfound, I think, energy on this. Um, just to tell you a little bit about it, we do collaborate quite closely with OMB on it, as uh, Chair Lago has mentioned. That's been increasing over this uh, administration with, uh, I think, a stronger partnership than when we, we started. Um, the part of the document you allude to, the, the strategy in the, the front part, is something that we spent a lot of time working with both OMB and other capital agencies on to say, how should we be doing capital planning and what is the strategy for the city? Mm -hmm. The second part of the document gets very deep into the budgetary numbers, as I'm sure you've seen and something that is a stronger point of OMB's uh, purvey, if you will, in terms of them saying what is the responsible way to budget over the 10 years. Those meet in the middle, um, and I think you can see the principles that we are putting in the preliminary budget. I think as you get to the executive budget, there'll be more on the investment priorities, and you'll see a tighter connection, but I think in the preliminary, we wanted to lay out the principles that all agencies strive for, and then I think the, the, the back end, again, gets into actual allocations, which gets into a lot more specifics as to what each agency must have uh, in the near term for state of good repair, and then how you think about the remainder that the, the budget is capable of holding. If I might note, um, when I arrived, I was shown the um, planning focus in the preliminary 10-year capital strategy, and it was one page with a few graphs on it. Last year, we, through engagement with OMB, were able to put in place a narrative that began to tease out these guiding principles. This year, there is a far more robust section, and it includes examples which bring to life what these principles are, what it is we're trying to achieve. And so I'm confident that given the progress since the beginning of this administration, we are going to see an increased planning focus in the budgeting process. Okay, thank you. I know my time is up, so I'll just say I look forward to continuing to work with you as we get to an executive uh, budget. But I do think, you know, as a city, while, you know, many of us may not necessarily be here beyond this term, we really have to look at the city's demographics, population shifts, and growth. Um, and we have to look at it from much more than a zoning perspective in terms of schools and all the amenities that every neighborhood should need. And I agree with the chair, with or without a zoning, we should be looking at that well beyond just Year five. So I want to make sure the 10-year capital plan, if we do talk about revisions, we have to make sure that all of that money is not front-loaded in the first five years and that it's more of an accurate reflection of growth that we expect through the entire 10-year strategy. So I thank you so much, and I'll turn it back to our chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Gibson. Um, chair, I, I, I have another question regarding your dual role as the uh, chair and the director. Has your role as a director of city planning, have your agency ever approved an application and then it went before the commission and then your role as the chair of the commission, that application was denied? To clarify, the department does not approve applications. Um, what we do is we review applications to make sure that they are complete and ready to start the EULA process. That is not a statement that the private application has been taken on by the department. Okay. Uh, my other question is about the borough-based jails. What was uh, DCP's role in the selection of the borough-based jails? There are rezonings that are happening, and they are, gonna, they are going to certify soon, so I'm pretty sure that as every ULAP happens, city planning is involved in, the, in, in those applications before they are certified. We were not involved in the selection. 
we will be very involved, obviously, as site selection progresses through the Euler process. So your agency has not has not had meetings or have not met with the administration about the selection of borough-based jails compared to the Littman Commission's recommendations? Oh no, we have, we clearly have met with sister agencies that are involved, whether the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, whether DDC, but we were not the ones who made the determination that is driven by the programmatic agencies. Was, was your agency involved in that decision making? Was your agency consulted in that decision making? We in the were, site selection of these borough-based jails? No, we worked with a group that um, is looking at the design considerations, what a modern jail is, um, what are the features of it, how does it fit in an urban environment, but we were not involved in the site selection. I I'm surprised you were not involved in the site selection since in, some of these sites have to be zoned for that use. Yeah. The, um, Chair, this is the role that city planning plays with respect to any facility that comes before us. If the Department of Sanitation is looking to locate a garage, they determine with DCAS what meets their needs, and then the actual site selection comes through the Euler process, and that is how we get involved. But we don't make the, the determinations, the real estate determinations about what piece of property meets the programmatic needs of other city agencies. All right. My other question is, I know that this it may be a moot point right now, uh, but the, the entire issue with the Amazon deal, um, you know, the, the, the biggest public outcry was that the mayor and the governor, that the mayor circumvented the democratic process, which is the Euler process, and kind of shifted, you know, did not allow the community to have their say as to where Amazon is, was being placed. Um, did your, was your agency consulted with, with this um, decision that the mayor and governor made? We were, um, first I'll note that the use of a ESD general project plan is not all that common, but has been used for major projects in the city, um, ranging from the redevelopment of 42nd Street to Atlantic Yards, now called Pacific Park in Brooklyn, to Columbia's Manhattanville project, uh, major projects. So it is a tool that is available to the city and the state. Um, we have at the Department of City Planning engaged in Long Island City over the years and have developed waterfront guidelines and those waterfront guidelines that would guide any development, whether today, post Amazon or Amazon, and they were part of the discussions, but we never met with Amazon. Did you meet with the mayor's office regarding their plans on circumventing the democratic process and, um, and moving forward with this override? We were not consulted about the decision to use the GPP, although I will note that our waterfront guidelines, which uh, shape and protect the public realm, are developed well before Amazon and continue to this day. All right. I will now give uh, Chair Moya two minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, really quickly, um, thank you again for, for your time. Uh, when it deals with schools, does DCP plan on implementing any mechanisms uh, for incentivizing construction of public schools on private land uh, in future rezonings? Uh, and does this require any additional funding? Um, we routinely engage with the School Construction Authority. And with respect to private land, um, when we know that there is an identified need, we routinely refer the private applicants to discuss with SCA. What, um, it, what can be a challenge is, or what we have found to be the case, is that the discussions are generally most productive when it is a larger piece of land. Because if one is to be able to accommodate the very different needs of a school and let's say a residential building, um, there is the need for separate cores, separate elevator shafts. Um, it is generally not possible to put a residence above a school. And so it works best when there is uh, both a large enough piece of land 
and a high enough density that one can have a school or schools, as in the case of 80 Flatbush, coexisting with a residential tower. And just with that, uh, if it is in a uh, school district that is overcrowded, uh, is it a priority for DCP to consider that mixed-use development? Again, if the piece of property is amenable to it, yes. And have you seen any resistance from the development community to incorporate schools into uh, the mixed-use development uh, that are before the Department of City Planning? And if so, what were their concerns? The concerns would be if the property is too small, where there just isn't the opportunity to have the two cores, to have the recreation space, the outdoor recreation space, to just fit the program. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Chair. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, last round of questions, promised. I uh, want to talk about community boards. I'm a former community board district manager. And in, in, that, in my capacity, my former capacity as district manager, I always felt that the Department of City Planning did not, uh, did not take the, well, the majority of the times our recommendations were not met. Um, and so uh, how, how does this current administration, your, your current administration, take into consideration community board recommendations for these land use applications? Um, community boards are our lifeblood at city planning. Um, any project that goes through the Euler process is preceded by a hearing at the community board, as you know, and at the, by the borough president. Um, you referenced the fact that recommendations came with conditions. Where, what saddens me is when we get a community board saying no without conditions, because that is a lost opportunity to explain what the concerns are. Um, we recently had um, a project come through with a no and no conditions, and fortunately we had a city planning commission public hearing where members of the public came forward, and so our eyes were opened to what the concerns were, and as a result the city planning commission modified the application. Um, with respect to the conditions, um, they break down into two large categories. Frequently the conditions are not related to land use, and so the City Planning Commission is prohibited from being able to address them, although I'll note in many instances, the council, which is not so bound, is able to address um, a broader array. For every decision of the City Planning Commission, in our, we produce a detailed report. The report summarizes what the community board has sent to us, including all of the recommendations that are there. We also summarize all of the testimony at the public hearing before the City Planning Commission and at the, by the Borough President's hearing as well. Um, we then, in our report, have a section called the Consideration Section in which we address each of the community boards and the Borough President's recommendations. And um, that serves as a permanent record a very helpful record for people who might want to pursue an application and see how the commission thought about the issue on prior occasions. All right, just want to point out um, that right before I got elected, my community board was going through the MIZQA process. And it was very challenging uh, for, for my community board to understand what was happening because uh, the um, representative from the Department of City Planning, they themselves not understand it. However, it's been our experiences that when there are city applications, this, the, the urban planner, which the Department of City Planning provides, they kind of curtail the conversations to favor the mayor's office, which is the applicant opposed to community concerns. And um, it's frustrating, Commissioner, and I really hope that you can meet with your borough, com your borough directors uh, because community boards are the first level of government and at times we feel that our voices are not heard and the individuals who are there representing your agency, rightfully so, they do work for the mayor, but they are pushing the mayor's agenda and we feel that the community's um, input or the community's preference is being pushed to the side. I would um, note that 
I think it appropriate, obviously, that as a mayoral agency, we would be supportive of mayoral initiatives, but very much take to heart that the purpose of the public review process is to listen to, to hear, to learn from the wisdom that comes from communities. I want to thank you for coming. I just want to recognize that we, we were joined by Council, Constant, uh, Council Member Constantinides and Council Member Landa. Do you have questions, Council Member Landa? No? And we are joined by Chair Koo. Thank you very much for, your, for coming and testifying today. Um, up next, in about five minutes, we will have uh, Do It.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, and I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Land Use. Today's hearing will cover the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget for the Department of Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. Because there are significant tech issues pertaining to the city's franchise agreements with cable and telecommunication companies, this is a joint hearing with the Committee on Land Use and the Committee on Technology. I would like to thank my colleagues, Council Member uh, Ku, Chair of the Committee on Technology for, for, for co-chairing today's budgetary hearings. Do it provide citywide coordination and technical expertise in the development and use of data, voice, and video technologies and the city services and operations. They also provide infrastructure support for data processing and communication services to numerous city agencies, researches and manages IT projects and administers the city's cable television, public paid telephones, and mobile and high capacity telecommunication franchise agreements. Of particular interest is the issue between charter communications and the New York State Public Service Commission. As you are aware, in July, in July last year, the Public Service Commission voted to kick Spectrum out of the state after the company failed to deliver on its fast internet promises. As such, we would like to hear the role do it plays in the administration of franchise agreement. Specifically, we would like to know the ways in which DOIT can increase the transparency of internet speeds and telecom services in the city's franchise agreements, so as to ensure that large corporations are providing the services they advertise to hardworking New Yorkers. Furthermore, I would like to know more about the rollout process of the Link NYC kiosk around the city and any issues DOIT has identified with the rollout process to date. With an operating budget of over $670 million and hundreds of millions more in capital investments, we must thoroughly examine DOIT's financial plan, its planned projects, and operational challenges to ensure that we are optimizing our return on this substantial investment. We hope that today's hearing will contribute to our efforts in finding ways to use technology to make government more efficient and productive. We look forward to working with DOIT towards meeting this goal. I would like to thank DOIT's commissioner, Samir, Saini and his staff for joining us today. I hope I got your name right. Yes. All right, good. <laughs> With that, I would like to pass it on to my colleague, Chair Ku, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Samanaga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, known as DOIT. My name is Peter Ku, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Technology. Today's hearing is joined with the Committee on Land Use. And I would like to thank my colleague, Councilmember Samalaka, and chair of the Committee on Land Use for co-chairing today's hearing with me. The department's proposed fiscal 2020 expense budget totals approximately $679 million, including $141.8 million in intra-city payments from other agencies for providing telecommunications and data services and support for which do it coordinates uh, uh, payment. Do it Fiscal 2020 preliminary budget is $12.7 million, more than the fiscal 2019 adopted budget of $666.7 million. The increase is primarily due to increased funding of New York City Cyber Command, as its budget is expected to grow in the coming fiscal years. At today's hearing, we hope to examine all components of the department's fiscal 2020 budget. Its contract budget that is projected at $249.6 million and its anticipated miscellaneous revenue streams, the majority of which come from cable television franchise fees. The committee will also like to discuss the department's capital commitment, the, the, the capital commitment plan, which totals approximately 
$603.8 million between fiscal 2019 through fiscal 2023. I would also like to hear updates on the decommissioning process of the city wireless networks known as W known as NYC Win, which I highlighted during the last year's preliminary budget hearing. City investments in technology will provide long-term benefit for the city with the goal of making our city more productive and efficient. However, we must be diligent and prudent about which projects we select in order to ensure that causes for technology projects do not spiral out of control. Ultimately, we must ensure that we are making the best use of taxpayers' uh, dollars. For this reason, the committee is interested to hear updates on major ongoing IT projects, mainly 5G, the work done on the next generation 9-11 implementation, and the progress of the Link NYC rollout, among others. I would like to welcome Dewitt Commissioner Sammy Sani and his team. After the testimony, members will have the opportunity to follow up with questions uh, for the commissioner. After that, I hope the commissioner and staff remain to listen to the public to testify. In closing, I would like to thank the committee staff for working out uh, putting uh, this hearing together, including Sebastian Bachi, John Russell, Irene Bajoyski, Patrick Muhill, as well as my chief of staff, uh, Elaine Chong. Now I will ask the committee council to please swear in the commissioner. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and answer honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Begin. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Chair Salamanca and Ku, and members of the City Council Committees on Land Use and Technology. My name is Samir Saini, and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT, and New York City's Chief Information Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, today about DOIT's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. With me, uh, I have to my left our General Counsel, Michael Pastor, and to my right, uh, John Winker, Associate Commissioner for Financial Services. DOIT's Financial 2020 Preliminary Budget provides for operating expenses of approximately $679 million, uh, allocating $175.6 million in personal services to support 1,887 full-time positions, and $503.4 million for other than personal services, or OTPS. Intracity funds transferred from other agencies account for $142 million, or about 21% of the total budget allocation. Telecommunications costs represent the largest portion of the intracity expense projected at $89.1 million for fiscal 2019. For fiscal year 2019, the budget appropriation increased by $4.1 million from fiscal year 2020's November financial plan. The increases to the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget are largely attributed to a $3 million grant funding uh, role from fiscal year 18 uh, to fiscal year 19 uh, for the Community Development Disaster uh, Program. For fiscal year 2020, the budget appropri appropriation increased by $4.5 million. We have implemented savings and efficiencies across several programs. Uh, we have put forward citywide cost avoidance uh, efforts through our uh, software asset uh, management division, um, which will entail do it regularly working with agencies to ensure that they deploy licenses in the most cost-effective ways to their users. The effort is projected to result in an estimated net cost of avoidance uh, to the city of 10.6 million per fiscal year. Throughout the year, we have strived to find savings both citywide and within do it by negotiating citywide contracts. Our citywide contracts have enabled agencies to procure 
uh, critical goods and services faster and at a, great, uh, at a greatly reduced rate than they would have been able to uh, through individual contracts. We continue to expand this valuable suite of citywide technology contracts. We do the heavy lifting on negotiating pricing and terms and conditions so we can leverage our aggregate citywide uh, purchasing power to drive aggressive discounts across all agencies. Our recent example is a citywide license agreement uh, for ServiceNow. It's a platform which uh, allows agencies, including Do It, to streamline their IT operations. We have negotiated terms and price holds for 10 years uh, uh, covering all city agencies with discounts that save approximately 500,000 across the city on an annual basis, amounting to approximately five million in savings for the term of the contract. This particular license agreement not only saves the city money, but it also creates oper operational efficiencies um, within agencies by automating core processes. We've also successfully negotiated contracts with two competing resellers um, that allow agencies to purchase IT goods and related services that will ease uh, purchasing for a broad range of hardware, software, cloud, and related service uh, purchases at large discounts. We're also proud of our performance in awarding contracts to minority and women-owned businesses, or MWBs. In October of 20, uh, 2018, DOIT was recognized by City Hall as a top performing agency for awarding more than $449 million to MWBEs since 2015. As the council may be aware, the city recently implemented a new 150,000 MWBE discretionary uh, purchasing method. And since its implementation um, in August, DOIT has been the lead agency for the city on using this new method. Uh, having awarded 52 contracts directly to MWBEs worth over $4.2 million. Aside from that, within the last year, we awarded a citywide IT purchase contract uh, to an MWBE with a contract authority of $285 million over five years. Further, the master contract has a 20% goal of MWBE participation at the individual order level, which do it actively monitors and enforces. These key initiatives are just a small part of a wider strategic plan that we plan to release shortly. In my first year here, I've been working uh, hard within DoIT and with our agency customers to do four things. And the first is to prepare our organization for changes that will strengthen our role and position as the technology center of excellence for New York City government. The second is to run our operations in a more efficient and effective ways to dramatically improve service quality and customer satisfaction. The third is to grow our capacity to deliver on the services for which there is growing customer demand by our agency customers. And the fourth is to transform how we empower customers to improve how they support and serve all New Yorkers. With this strategic plan, when this strategic plan is unveiled, I'll be more than happy to take a deeper dive with the committees to show the great things to come here at Do It. Finally, before I take questions, I'd like to take the opportunity to address a topic that has been top of mind for the council and our agency over the past year, our relationships with our cable franchisees, Charter Spectrum, Altice, and Verizon. We have been engaged in conversations with the chairs and committee members uh, about ways we as city can work together to hold these companies accountable. Given the limited scope of our cable t uh, television franchise uh, agreements, which come up for renewal next calendar year, we've developed legislation with the law department and the mayor's office of the CTO that would establish privacy protections and expanded consumer protections for all customers, for all services these franchisees offer beyond cable, including broadband and voice. We fully appreciate the council's interest and leadership in this particular policy area. Chair Koo is the prime sponsor of both bills, Introduction 1101 and Introduction 1102, and has graciously introduced these into the Technology Committee. And Chair Salamanca is a co-sponsor for both uh, pieces of legislation. We look forward to having the opportunity to discuss uh, them at another hearing and are happy to answer any outstanding questions the committees may have about this package. 
With respect to the enforcement of our franchise agreements, as the committees know, we have been engaged in several audits of charter communications. Last year, we issued a notice of default of our franchise agreement pertaining to fair labor practices um, as a result of the NLRB ruling against the company for interfering with workers' rights to organize. As recently as December, we issued another default to Charter for failing to comply with our franchise agreement provision pertaining to the hiring of local vendors. Today, I can share that we have completed our financial audit and have found Charter in default for altering the method of calculation for their franchise fee payments since their merger with Time Warner Cable. Our audit has found that Charter owes the city approximately $6 million in unpaid fees. We gave them a notice on February 6th and gave them until March 1st to cure. As many of you may already be aware, we issued Charter a notice, uh, a notice of default yesterday for failing to pay this outstanding fee. This does not end with a default. We plan to pursue all possible remedies to retrieve the revenue we believe the city is owed. And we will certainly consider these defaults as we evaluate Charter's future as a cable television franchisee for the city. With that, I'm happy to take questions for the committees and thank you once again for the opportunity to testify before you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Just want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Lander, Chair Moya, and uh, Councilmember Richards was here earlier. Uh, so uh, my first question in regards to the charter communications and default with the City of New York for their failure to pay six million dollars in television franchise fees. Um, you know, we this committee would like to know first what actions does the city plan to take as a result of Charter's default? Sure. Um, I'm going to ask my general counsel, Michael Pastor, to, um, to answer that question. He's been taking lead on, um, on this effort with, uh, with Charter. Michael. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, hello, council members. So the actions we plan to take are dictated by a franchise agreement that we have with Charter. Uh, we noticed the default yesterday. Um, they have 10 days officially under the, under the franchise agreement to cure. In this instance, the cure is straightforward. It's payment to the city of the amounts that are owed. If they do not cure, then the franchise agreement lays out the steps thereafter, which would be a default of, uh, of the franchisee, um, and then we would pursue whatever, whatever, whatever other remedies we needed to pursue um, to get the money we think the city is owed. Can they challenge that decision from do it, uh, the dollar amount? They, they very well might. They, they have challenged and disagree with the dollar amount. We feel strongly about our calculations um, and we'll proceed. If there's a disagreement, there has been disagreement between Charter and Do It all along, it remains so. They disagree with our findings, but we feel confident in, in what we concluded. What's the process, the next step, they, if they should, they should they disagree? Uh, the next step would be uh, 10 days. 10 days need to run uh, under the contract for them to cure. Um, they would either cure, which would be the remittance of monies to do it, uh, or they would not, and then we would issue a, the formal default occurs thereafter. Should they not pay this, uh, the, uh, this um, six million dollars and they go on default, what's next? So I don't want to, to speculate too much, council member, about what happens because we'll have to see how it shakes out. But as we've stated publicly, as the commissioner just testified to, um, we will pursue whatever avenues we need to pursue to obtain that uh, money from Charter. Okay. All right. I'm going to leave the rest of the questions of Charter to my colleagues. Uh, just have um, something interesting here. I'm a former district manager for a community board. So this uh, installation of city city net our community boards has always interested me. Um, I know that some community boards, at least one in the Bronx, has it, um, but they had to pay for it out of their operating budget. Mm. What is the cost uh, to supply all 59 community boards with CityNet? I don't have that exact cost uh, with me, but I could, I could certainly, um, uh, council member, um, have my team evaluate uh, what that would cost. And who would pay for it? Well, there isn't a pro appropriated budget, right, within within um, uh, w within our within our budget for to cover that cost. So we'd have to reallocate funds, right, for uh, from some other bucket, right, to cover this. But to your point, we can certainly evaluate what the estimate would be, right, to get everyone on on city net. I've heard this request before. So it's not part of any five-year capital plan. It's not part of the current budget. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm gonna hand it off to Chair Cool. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Um, Commissioner Sani, yeah. since you are now one year on the job, I wanted uh, to ask you uh, the following. Are there any new in initiatives you have put in place over the past year to improve agency operation? Several. <laughs> um, and again, much of um, what we've accomplished uh, over the past year will be actually within the strategic plan um, that we're going to publish. Um, it'll be the three-year plan, but also a look back at what we've done to improve um, our internal operations, but also improve customer service for um, all the agencies that we support. So just to give you some, some examples uh, of accomplishments um, from a internal operation, operational efficiency um, uh, in service quality perspective, um, one of my key focus areas was to improve the reliability of our core infrastructure services um, that um, uh, our agency customers rely on every day. Um, so what we've done is instituted new governance procedures, um, new tools, um, uh, 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 innovative tools for monitoring, um, and um, expanded sort of training within our staff, which has resulted in double-digit reduction in the number, number of outages and the duration of outages um, uh, for um, critical services for agencies. Uh, so it's, it's been a, it's working, I guess, is uh, based on the numbers, the, the initiatives we've led have worked. And it's a mixed bag of, of efforts across people, process, and technology. But that's been one example of, a, I think, a huge win um, within the past year. Thank you, yeah. On, uh, on 5G internet connectivity, this is the biggest topic everybody's talking about, <laughs> Commissioner. In the previous uh, preliminary budget hearing, hmm. you testified that the agency was working on developing 5G internet connectivity uh, for the city of New York. Can you give us an update on the work that is being done on the 5G uh, internet connectivity? Sure, so let me, let me first start by saying 5G is new, and uh, we're certainly focused on ensuring we help enable the deployment of 5G technology, and that specifically is what's called new, uh, small cells, which are small antennas that allow um, for um, uh, uh, fast um, uh, gigabit plus transmission of data at short distances using this, this, these mini antennas uh, mounted on, on right-of-way infrastructure. But I'll, before I talk about 5G, let me also, let me just mention that 4G LTE coverage that's equitably distributed across our boroughs is, is still a priority because that still is, is something that, that must be accomplished before we look to um, mm. uh, expanding 5G, which is relatively new. Um, I'm gonna ask Michael Pastor to, to elaborate a little bit about our telecom franchise um, authority and where we're headed um, with that. Uh, yes, Chair so I think the, the two things I would add to that is um, we have a, um, an RFP out for a new mobile telecom franchises, which expires, um, and we are reviewing those responses. I don't wanna give too, too much information about um, our view of that other than to say that our, our lens for our review of that has an eye towards 5G, of course, because 5G is coming around the corner. Um, I think in addition to that, we work very collaboratively with the mayor's office of the chief technology officer uh, to think about the things that the city can be doing to um, be hospitable to 5G technologies. Okay, so um, when can the city see the role of 5G connectivity? Uh, I think it's a little bit hard to say. I think it's a little bit hard to say. I think that it's gonna depend upon, uh, the, upon the carriers. Um, the information we're seeing is that uh, it can vary depending upon the, the, the cityscape and the landscape. So um, I, I don't know if there's a good, if there's a real good answer to, to say it will be here at X time. Yeah, so there's no deadline or no? No, there, there's no deadline, but I'll, I'll say this, 5G is a new technology. And although it's in the press quite a bit, <laughs> Uh, and it is exciting technology that eventually um, uh, cities will, will, will move to um, uh, through carrier partners. There are, there are constraints and limitations, right, that 5G um, has. For example, um, something that perhaps many people aren't aware is that 5G, which is dependent on these small cells mounted mm -hmm. um, at high density 
uh, on um, street infrastructure can't penetrate walls. So when you have a multifamily complex um, and you have small cells deployed around the perimeter, the 5G signal, right, and all the benefits of a gigabit plus speed actually aren't realized within the home because the signal can't penetrate through, through the walls. So this is a limitation of 5G. Um, sure, it's great outside, but it's not, you know, the, but you're still getting 4G LTE equivalent coverage inside your house, although there's 5G small cells outside your home. So, but that said, we, we understand that this is the direction that um, uh, all cities are going to. There's huge potential with 5G, and I think we'd start with um, uh, piloting, right, this technology, um, uh, and then seeing where it goes from there. Uh, but certainly there are challenges to overcome for a, a scaled deployment of, of it across uh, across the city. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is on the the NYC win update. Uh, last year you allocated 4.8 million dollars in fiscal 2018 to cover the costs mm -hmm. associated with developing the scope of work for the commissioning process of uh, NYC win. Can you like provide a status update on the decommissioning process for uh, of uh, NYCWIN? Sure. So nice win. Um, uh, I think I testified about this uh, last year in the budget hearing um, as well. Nice win is um, at its uh, uh, end of its useful life. Um, we are actively working to migrate um, uh, this network to um, uh, carriers networks. Um, we are targeting for a full uh, shutdown of the NICE network by June of 2020. Followed by that will be about 18 to 24 months uh, of um, breaking down that the infrastructure, um, the legacy uh, uh, infrastructure for NICE when that covers mm -hmm. across 390 facility sites. Um, and then it will be officially off. But by June 2020, we'll be off of Nice One. We'll be on carrier networks. So, so what are the approximate savings that will be generated by decommissioning? The savings will be will be significant. Um, so, uh, just to remind the uh, the councils, uh, the Nice One costs us about 40 million a year today to maintain. Once we move to carrier networks, we're probably looking at about a $10 million a year ex uh, expense. So we're looking at 20 million annual savings, roughly, mm. um, uh, year over year. Um, so the payback for this will be, um, was, will be, will be quick. Um, but again, we're looking at June 2020 to, to shut it down, 18, 24 months, to break, break it down, right, and then, uh, and then take it from there. So when will the city begin to realize these savings? Uh, let me uh, hand that off to John Winker to elaborate on the, on the financials. Yes, good afternoon. As the commissioner stated, after the June 2020 decommissioning of the actual network, turning it off, is about a 24-month 20, period where we'll be using the current $40 million allocation per year mm -hmm. to actually pay for the deconstruction of sites. So we expect that over those two years, those funds will still be in our budget and we'll probably be, we'll be seeing the savings themselves, the net savings in fiscal 2022, 23, mm. somewhere around there, 22, 23. So uh, do you anticipate city agencies uh, will have trouble uh, transferring out of, w, uh, out of NYC wind? No, we don't. Uh, again, we're, we're actively working with the agencies that use uh, NICEWIN. Um, there's, there's several agencies that use it, but there's really four power agencies um, that, uh, um, that leverage it extensively. That's NYPD, FDNY, uh, DEP, uh, and DOT. Um, so we're working uh, uh, actively with them to move them to uh, these carrier networks, and we don't foresee any problems. So far, so good. So what happens to the equipment once it's decommissioned? Say the John Yacht? No. Uh, John, can you elaborate on that? Well, essentially the equipment is end of life. So it will be essentially sold for salvage to the extent it can. Otherwise, it will be just disposed of. Thank you. Yeah. So I have one more question for you, Jesse. Um, on the PET target, the, the administration allowance programs 
to eliminate the gap, PEG, uh, targets for all city agencies in order to achieve $750 million in savings between fiscal 2019 and fiscal uh, 2020, OMB has set to its savings target at $15.7 million, which is approximately 3% of the city-funded budget in both fiscal 2019 and fiscal uh, 2020. Will it be a challenge in order to achieve these savings? Oh, it's going to be a piece of cake. A piece of cake? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so we just received our, our PEG, um, as did um, all the other um, city agencies. Uh, John and I and, and several of my staff are working hard to uh, look uh, under the hood and identify the savings um, internally um, without disrupting operations and services to our agency customers. So we're, we're at that, uh, we're, we're doing that right now as we speak, and um, I think we're, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be okay. Okay, so is there room to go beyond the savings target? There's no room to go beyond the savings. <laughs> <laughs> no, you say it's a piece of cake. <laughs> piece of cake for the number we were given. <laughs> no more. Well, the target is spread over two years, so we're looking at the budgets over both of those years, and ultimately, we're working with our divisions to make sure that the reductions that we do take Boy. have minimal business impact. I will turn over questioning uh, to uh, Councilmember Moyer. Thank you. Uh, Chair Kuhn, thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, Commissioner, thank you, and, and to your entire team who has uh, always been uh, extremely responsive to a lot of the concerns that uh, we have had, and I know that you have all been working very diligently um, to lead up to uh, not just this hearing, but uh, to a lot of the concerns that we have had uh, in the past. I just want to go uh, quickly uh, back to dealing with charter. Um, given that this is now the third time uh, that they've defaulted. Uh, we know that uh, it's $6 million now. How does the city intend to fill that gap uh, of the $6 million uh, now that the uh, charter has uh, defaulted? I'm going to ask John to, to take that. Okay. I mean, as of now, we're still projected to meet our revenue targets for FY19, so we don't necessarily have a gap. This is considered to be an underpayment, not necessarily meeting their minimum commitments. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, we don't necessarily see a problem with that necessarily. Ultimately, they owe us this funding based on the audit, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a problem for us to meet our revenue targets. Okay. Um, and also with the amount of uh, labor issues yeah. uh, and now it's failure to pay, uh, for its fair share, uh, why should we renew Charter's franchise uh, with the city? Uh, I'll take that one, Commissioner, if I may. So, uh, hi, Councilmember Moya. Um, I think that, that whenever we talk about renewal, it is, it is worthwhile setting the context, which is that um, the renewal of cable franchises is somewhat subscribed in, in federal law in terms of the things that um, a franchisee can or cannot take into account um, when a cable franchisee such as Charter or the other two um, franchisees come up for renewal. Um, with that said, as, as I, I believe I said earlier and, and the Commissioner said in his testimony, um, you know, one of the core pillars of a franchisee's obligations is to provide cable service and to pay. Um, and so we, we take this default seriously as we take all the default faults seriously and it's something that we'll be considering um, when the renewal process uh, happens next year. Great. Um, also, now just moving um, on to, uh, to something else, uh, with, the, with the FCC, the second further notice uh, of proposed rulemaking, uh, in December of 2018, uh, the Committee uh, on Technology voted and passed Resolution 620, uh, which called on the Federal Communications uh, Commission to reject the proposed uh, rules that were put forth. Uh, in the second further notice of proposed rulemaking 18131, uh, and to create provisions that would strengthen public, educational, and governmental access television. Uh, now that 18131 uh, would require 
uh, local franchising authorities to choose between reducing annual franchise fee renewals, uh, revenues, uh, and or fewer public uh, educational and governmental access channels uh, and other in-kind service benefits. Uh, what is the anticipated impact this rule uh, would have on the revenue that the city collects uh, through its cable television franchise agreements? So uh, first of all, I think we want to thank the council for that resolution and for um, aligning with us and supporting us in, in our op. We, we oppose that um, proposed rule as well. Um, to answer the council member's question, we have not done any calculations specifically because the rule has not take, taken effect. It is something we might consider doing, and I will take that under advisement. Okay. And is can you uh, uh, provide the committee with the, any status update on the FCC's uh, response to Resolution 620? Uh, I will I will look into that and do that, yes. Great. And I just have one more quick question, um, Mr. Chair, uh, and it just goes to dealing with uh, net neutrality. Um, fiscal 2020, New York State Executive Budget proposed requiring state agencies and other state authorities uh, to procure services uh, for only those internet service providers, the uh, ISPs, uh, that adhere to net neutrality principles. However, the federal uh, attorney general uh, stated that individual state uh, net neutrality's principles are illegal uh, and since the FCC has the sole authority to create uh, rules for broadband internet providers. Um, what principles are set in place to ensure that uh, the internet service providers uh, abide by the uh, new state uh, net neutrality laws? Uh, and are there any legal repercussions uh, that may uh, arise from the federal government uh, through the enactment of this legislation? So I'll, I'll take that, Councilman, if I understood your question. So we don't, over, as a locality, we don't oversee the state, the state laws. So it would be more up to the state to determine how they um, uh, enforce those laws. I will say that we um, have an advocacy role. Or is there anything that the city um, could implement to ensure that that is uh, abided by the law. Yes, so we are somewhat more constrained by law than the state uh, on this point, um, but we, whenever we can um, uh, seek to um, instill net neutrality principles within our contractual vehicles, we do that, which is what we did with Link NYC. The Link NYC franchise right. agreement has a net neutrality provision. That's one of our key tools, but another big tool is advocating and, and right. working with our federal partners to try to get um, net neutrality back where we think it needs to be. Great. Th thank you very much uh, for your testimony today, and thank you to both chairs. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Kalos. How are you doing? Good. How are you? How's your open data week? It's great, actually. How, how many how, how many op uh, open data uh, week of events have you 12? attended? Third, uh, tw oh, uh, personally. Personally. Oh, I actually am just getting over strep. So I haven't attended. I, I think have I've attended probably... infinitely more than you have. I will ensure that I attend more and I don't catch uh, anything during open data weeks moving I forward. use open <laughs> data a lot to try to convince the administration that uh, the things I think are problems based on anecdotal information are actually problems based on uh, data patterns. One of the problems that I run into is that uh, uh, information is only as good as how it's inputted. Uh, the phrase goes garbage in, garbage out. Right. Uh, would do it be willing to convene so I don't have to pass a task force bill because I hate task force bills and I hate doing bills when we could just get it done together. Mm. Uh, creating a, a power users group where you do a uh, quarterly meeting with agency stakeholders, perhaps three one one and others, and users mm. to go over data sets and where the data sets are failing and mm. letting people make requests and getting back to folks so that the data is actually as useful as possible. I, I'm open to the conversation, so uh, if we could connect offline, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. I was hoping for a yes. That was the softball. Pretty, pretty uh, close. Pretty close to yes. <laughs> uh, Mox has a product called Passport. Yes. Uh, you're putting uh, par approximately five million dollars into it. Uh, it's unable. I can't log into the Passport site and just pull out uh, contracts. Uh, will you just? pop what's in the Passport site into open data so people can transparently look at every single city contract without having to go to a terminal in the MOX building at 253 Broadway? Uh, I guess the 
the You're spending five million dollars. Assu assuming there's no um, there's no violation of uh, the pri of privacy policy, then I don't see why that would be an issue. Great. Uh, but I think it's something I would want to discuss with Moda uh, and the chief analytics officer the, uh, as well. <clears throat> the zoning and franchises chair uh, made reference to our franchise agreement. Mm -hmm. Working with the Public Service Commission, I was able to secure a commitment from Charter to abide by the net neutrality rules voluntarily. Mm -hmm. At the time, the FCC had already promulgated rules, so they thought this was a free giveaway. Now, New York State is one of the last jurisdictions standing to maintain net neutrality. New York City has franchising authority. Uh, will New York City mandate as part of its franchise that we have the net neutrality? Additionally, uh, we ask for a lot of money. I'm sitting on a $92 billion budget and we're asking for $150 million in franchise fees historically. Uh, what is more valuable, $150 million or bridging the digital divide and ensuring every single New Yorker gets there? With the Public Service Commission, I was able to help create Spectrum Internet Assist, which was then the model for Altice Internet Assist, but whether you're doing 5G uh, or the Fra Verizon franchise, is it possible to, as part of our franchise agreement, which you would be negotiating, say that what we'd rather have in lieu of the payment is uh, universal broadband for low-income New Yorkers, uh, every single NYCHA lit up with universal broadband and accessible lifeline requirement for mobile providers so that people can use their mobile devices to access. I'm sorry for going over, but oh, please. Michael, you wanna? Sure, I'll take that. So I think that, uh, Council Member, we definitely um, consider both goals to be laudable. One is to sort of increase um, broadband connectivity access through our franchise agreements, and the other one is we think that uh, our rights of way have value and, and, we think, and we think it makes sense to obtain value for the use of those valuable um, services. I think as we get ready to, to deal with our renewals, those two things will be, things will be weighing again as you framed it. Um, and I think that we, we, we want to, we have diff you know, we, multiple goals and you're looking at all of them and you're seeing how can, how can we achieve them and weigh them. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, Commissioner, uh, I have a few questions about the other franchise agreements that we have. Sure. Um, can you give us a status of the franchise agreements for uh, Altis, so Cablevision, and also for uh, Verizon? Sure, uh, Michael. Okay. Yes, so there's not much to report in terms of the status of those agreements other than as the council is aware, um, we are in active litigation with, uh, with our cable franchisee, Verizon Fios, over um, their build out. Sorry, Veri in Verizon? Verizon. Our we are in litigation right now with Verizon. Over You're in litigation. Over in LTS? No. When, when is their agreement up? Uh, all three cable uh, franchisees' agreements are up uh, in July of 2020. 20? Yep. Okay. Should uh, the state move forward with actually, um, I, I would say, removing Spectrum, a.k.a. Charter, what will happen what kind of impact will this have on city, on the um, on, on, on New Yorkers who use who use them as their provider, and what backup plan does the city have to ensure that they have services? So I think that this is something that we're thinking about. Um, as it is right now, you know, we haven't seen a lot of movement um, in that direction, and frankly, I think we all believe that um, the time will that where that will actually occur is is quite quite, quite you know, distant into the future were it to occur. Um, but I think it's a fair question. I think um, what we do from Dewitt's perspective is we enforce, we try to enforce our, our agreements as well as we can. Um, but I think that it's something, it's a fair question, maybe something we should be thinking about. Is this something that uh, Dewitt is in conversations with the state about? We are not in regular conversations with the PSC about their enforcement action, no. So you have not had, had any conversations with the state? Not recently. We have some conversations with them uh, last year, but um, no, no recent conversations with the PSC about that issue. So what is your plan? Should the state get rid of them? Uh, as I said, I think we think um, it's, it's somewhat... Uh, is there uh, a plan? Uh, I have no particular plan. Has there been conversations within your agency? Should they be removed from the state? We have had some preliminary discussions about it, but as I said, uh, Council Member, at, at, at the moment, we think the eventuality of charter being shut down in New York State is quite far off should it occur. Okay. I see here that DOE Master Service Agreement, MSA, um, 
master's services agreements for data and communication services. So in, 20, uh, in September of 2018, uh, the, the Department of Education requested authorization to utilize DUIS tele Telecom Master Services Agreement, also known as MSA, with Verizon's business network services for data and telecommunication services. What role did DUIT play in that agreement? John, can you comment on that? Well, we negotiated the overall MSA, the Master Services Agreement, and the Department of Education uh, put a contract in place on their own, utilizing the terms and conditions under that agreement. It's their own contract. So, you d what was your role? Was there? A well, role? we have the we hold the we hold we the, the master MSA. contract on on a citywide basis. All the agencies are allowed to put their own contracts in place and then procure services under the terms and conditions under the master contract. So are you aware of any work that was done or that was just solely the Department of Education who did that work on their own? That's correct. The Department of Education did it on their own. So they have their own IT division? That's correct. Oh, that's correct. Yeah. And they do not, your agency do it, does not talk to the Department of Education's IT division? You don't have oversight over the Department of Education's um, IT division? We do not have oversight over, that, over, over their IT division. That's interesting. Okay. Um, do it projects that it will generate $190 million in miscellaneous revenues for fiscal year 2020, yet there has been a decrease in revenue streams from cable television franchise agreements since fiscal year 2015. What are the main reasons for the revenue from Cablevision franchise fees decreased by $9 million since fiscal year 2015? Cord cutting. Sorry? Cord cutting. Okay. All right. So I, I would say New Yorkers are, are leading more to using their, yes. their iPads, <laughs> Netflix, than streaming. Streaming other than paying. Exactly. Okay. All right. Do you anticipate any further decreases in revenue from cable television franchises in, this, uh, in the next upcoming fiscal years? John? I mean, if you look at the uh, projected revenue for cable over the next few years, you will see it declining uh, in the base by a couple of million dollars. Uh, that is in recognition of the fact that people are moving to streaming services. What is that? What's a couple of million dollars? Um, when he looks for that answer, Commissioner, what are, what are DOIT's plans hmm. to replace that, that, that lost revenue? Uh, is there one? Well, I think we're, we're developing that plan. No. Okay. Can you share? We're still working on it, so I can, I can report that back to you once we're, we're finished with that evaluation. But again, I mean, the lost revenue is not really within our control. Um, people are cutting the, cutting the cord. Excuse me. We're looking at about $5 million between FY19 to FY22 and the declines in the cable revenue projections. Uh, as far as other alternatives, we are seeing increases in revenue from other avenues. Uh, so if you look at overall the do its revenue budget over the next several years, it's actually increasing as opposed to decreasing. This is just one funding stream that is decreasing. Right, and further to that point, if I may jump in, count, the, there has been a trend up in the mobile telecom franchise revenue. Okay. Uh, your Link NYC. Yes. Uh, where are we? How many, how many Link NYCs have been installed throughout the city of New York? So we have roughly 1,820 8, odd links uh, active, deployed um, across the five boroughs. There is a, there is a larger number um, within the Manhattan borough, and that's largely because there's a higher density of of, um, of um, old uh, phone phone booths um, in that in that borough, so there was a higher count. Right. What's the goal? What's the city's goal? The current agreement we have with the franchisee is a target of 7,500 links. And who uh, is the franchisee? Uh, it is City Bridge. City Bridge. Yes. And what was the total cost of this agreement? Uh, so it's a no cost to the city agreement, no cost whatsoever. There have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent already solely by the franchisee to, to do this capital program. It's, it's purely revenue to the city, no cost, cost at all. Yeah. I think that we estimate they've spent yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars already to make the, the rollout happen to date. So they are paying for the installations and the actual That's right. It's a ad-driven 
Um, so if you look at the kiosks and you'll notice there's ads that show up, um, the revenue, they're offsetting the cost, right, for the deployment and maintenance of the link kiosk through, um, through the generation of uh, ad revenue. Um, Using those those giant 50 inch screens on both sides. Is the city is the city uh, receiving any revenue from these advertisements on these kiosks? Sure. Uh, so I can have John review the revenues to date. Yes, correct. Uh, we do have a revenue budget. Uh, the there's a minimum amount in the revenue budget that the franchise needs to pay on an annual basis, which is about 27 million dollars. Uh, we are looking at. Since the inception of the program, over $90 million in revenue is collected by the city. So they have to pay the city $27 million per Minimum. year? Minimum. Minimum per yeah, year. Correct. And that's just with the 1,800 kiosk, or that's that? doesn't matter if they have one kiosk or... or, or 7,500. That's correct. It's $27 million. How do local community boards or local non nonprofits, uh, how can they advertise um, community meetings, um, you know, community events on these kiosks at zero cost to them. That's a, that's a great question, Michael. Right, they should engage, they can engage with us uh, directly, um, and we can help them uh, get help them get their advertising up um, via the the uh, managing company for the fr franchise, which isn't called Intersection. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Chair, that's it for me for now. Uh, I want to inform everyone, today is the anniversary of the signing of open data law. Yes. Yeah. Applause, please. So, so my, next, uh, my next question is, uh, the topic is next generation 911? Yes. Yeah. In the report your agency published in December 18, uh, titled uh, 2018 Annual Report on the Implementation of Next Generation 9. One one in NYC, uh, you mentioned that the city and do it are working on several upgrades to the outdated 911 systems. Thus, we would like to ask a few questions uh, regarding the report you published. Does the city anticipate recognizing budgetary savings by replacing the end of life components of the current 911 system? No, so the, the driver for the movement to next gen, next gen 911, which moves us, just to, to clarify, from an analog based uh, 911 system to an IP based system. And, uh, and what that means is uh, a, a wide spectrum of new features uh, uh, and capability for uh, both New Yorkers to be able to contact 911 um, through multimedia um, uh, channels, uh, uploading pictures and video and not just um, a simple SMS text. Uh, also enables um, uh, the 911 center itself, the PSACs, to be able to um, roll over um, the volume of their calls dynamically to, um, uh, to handle surges um, uh, in, in uh, 911 calls or, um, or text messages. Um, the, uh, so the driver isn't about cost savings, it's about, it's about public safety. Right, and improving public safety capability, um, both for the 911 center and for New Yorkers. So uh, project's doing well. We're in procurement right now, uh, and we're looking to go live by 2023. So do, do you anticipate uh, your agency will need additional resources to carry out this project? We, we will have to put in a capital request for um, for what's needed, right, to support the new system. Again, we're in the procurement phase right now. So once we see what the solution is going to look like, we can estimate what the total cost will be, and then that um, those CPs will be put forward, and then we'll we'll take it from there. So now we change the topic to on your ten-year capital strategy. Right? Do it ten-year capital strategy totals. $736 million, but the majority of their funding is fund loaded in the first two years, fiscal 2020 and fiscal 2021. So why is the majority of your capital funding fund loaded in the first two years of the 10-year capital strategy? Sure, I'm gonna ask John uh, to answer that. 
Well, if you looked at the 10-year flow that we have in the capital plan, uh, there's two real funding buckets that we manage. We have the data processing one, data processing two. Data processing one, that line item, is for the do it technology projects. DP2 is related to ECTP, uh, which still has FireCAD, EMS CAD, there's another JOC program, a, a, a Joint Operations Center that they're building up at PSAC 2 and PSAC 1. Those three line items remain open. Right now we have some certain fundings that are for DP2 that are only in FY20 and 21, they drop out in 22. If you took that away and just looked at the DP1 going out, it would be flat, roughly flat. So it is, it is a fact that ECTP is ending at, in FY21 that really looks, it makes it skewed in, in the, in the fir first two years of the plan. Do you anticipate use of all the capital funding uh, in fiscal 2020? As of now, yes. Okay. How often do you assess the budget accuracy of your budget of, of your capital strategy? Well, we're constantly reviewing all our budget allocations, whether it be expense revenue or capital. Uh, we work with OMB closely to make sure that if we see some delay in project. Uh, commitment, uh, funding commitment levels, we move the funds to the appropriate fiscal year, so it is an ongoing process. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I finished all the questions, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna call the next panel. Thank you, Great. commissioners. Yeah. Thank you very much, appreciate it. This way? Yeah. Uh, we're going to call on uh, Armando Maurice. Uh, Chapo, Chapo Ligren from ANHD and Ann Delgado Paula uh, Siegel and Valerio Oselli. Uh, so please identify yourself and you may begin and each each person have four minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Salamanca and members of the Land Use Committee. Uh, thank oh, you. Oh, I, 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 I correct myself. Yeah. Two minutes. Great, okay. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julia Durante Martinez, and I'm the Community Land Trust Coordinator at New Economy Project. New Economy Project co founded and co convenes the New York City Community Land Initiative, a coalition of more than two dozen housing and social justice organizations advocating for community land trusts to preserve and create deeply affordable housing and stabilized neighborhoods. As an outgrowth of this work, New Economy Project and 14 partner organizations are proposing a new citywide CLT initiative with fiscal year 2020 discretionary funding support that would incubate and expand CLTs in all five boroughs of New York City. CLTs are a proven mechanism to preserve vital affordable housing stock, prevent extraction of public subsidies, and combat displacement. A CLT is a nonprofit that owns and stewards land in the community's interests and leases use of that land for affordable housing development and other community needs. CLTs typically issue renewable 99-year ground leases that establish resale and rental restrictions, which protect public investments in CLTs from being lost to the market over time, a key advantage that CLTs have over conventional affordability terms of 15 to 30 years. The longstanding Cooper Squares Community Land Trust, who you'll hear from shortly, has developed and preserved 400 units of housing on Manhattan's Lower East Side for households earning roughly 30% of area median income and will continue to do so in perpetuity. CLTs also engage community members in meaningful decision making over neighborhood development and land use. CLT boards of directors are typically composed of equal parts CLT leaseholders, community members, and public stakeholders. Both Cooper Square Community Land Trust and the East Harlem El Barrio CLT grew out of sustained community-led planning and visioning processes and continue to have strong relationships with their community boards and other local partners. The CLT model has sparked a citywide movement that has achieved tremendous gains in recent years including passage of the city's first local law defining and entering CLTs into the administrative code, increased HPD support, expanded training, legal and technical assistance networks, and investment of New York State Attorney General settlement funds in local CLTs. More than a dozen community-based organizations from the Northwest Bronx to Brownsville are working to develop local leadership, deepen community partnerships, organize tenants and homeowners, and identify properties suitable for CLTs. The proposed citywide CLT initiative will allow groups to build upon this exciting progress at a critical moment of opportunity. We ask the committee to include the CLT initiative in its budget recommendations for fiscal year 2020. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. You should, you should turn your mic off. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, press the, press press the, the button. button. Okay, that's much better, thank you. So good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Land Use Committee. Uh, my name is Valerio Orselli. I am the Project Director of the Cooper Square Community Land Trust on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I'm here to express our strongest support for the New York City Community Land Initiative's application for a citywide CLT initiative recently submitted to the New York City Council. The Cooper Square CLT founded in 1994 is currently a fully functioning community land trust in New York City. We are presently working with NICELY in order for the Cooper Square CLT to be able to grow and provide technical assistance and support to emerging CLTs in all five boroughs. Our CLT is based on the principle of permanently affordable housing, which can be accomplished only through what we call the decommodification of the housing, that is through the use of grants and forgivable loans for the renovation coupled with strict resale restrictions. Cooper Square CLT, with no loans to repay, provides for social equity. By keeping maintenance fees and rents low, it allows its many residents to save money for a better education, child care, health care, start their business, travel, and the pursuit of creative activities, resulting in an enrichment of family life. Some 20 years after the renovation of our 21 buildings, our housing remains affordable to households earning $17,920 per year for a single person residing in a studio to $36,880 for a family of four in a three-bedroom apartment. By its ownership of the land under 21 buildings and leased to the Cooper Square MHA pursuant to 99-year lease, it exercised a stewardship role over the buildings helping to protect the long-term affordability. 
the stewardship role was a crucial factor in securing the New York State AG's office for a co-op plan. The CLT holds title to the land under the Cooper Square MHA and monitors and enforces the MHA's nonprofit ownership structure, long-term affordability, and resale restrictions to a ground lease. I know I'm out of time, so I can just wish to conclude by uh, referencing the chart that's part of my statement that I'm going to hand out to you folks and to point out that even with the economy of scale produced by the MHA and the CLT stewardship role, in order for the CLTs to succeed, they must grow, expand, and create CLTs throughout the city. I urge you to fund the citywide initiative, the first one in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next gentleman there. Uh, I don't really know how to use this thing, but there, there you go. go. So my name is Ed Delgado, and um, I was born and raised on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, as a New Yorker, um, I've seen the city change, and not for the better. Working people, minority people, ethnic groups are all being pushed out. Oh, poor people are being sent to homeless shelters or living in the street. I joined the Cooper Square Community Land Trust because I saw that they had a solution to this problem. That is uh, taking control of the land. Because if, you have, if the community has control of the land, no one can speculate on it. No one can push you out. We used to be communities. Now I don't know what we are. We are Starbucks and bars. Um, we desperately need community land trust citywide because this problem is not a low east side problem. It's happening in Queens, in Brooklyn, even on Staten Island, believe it or not. Um, so I urge you to please consider our request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to weigh in on the budget this year. My name is Paula Siegel. I am senior staff attorney at the Community Development Project. We are a nonprofit legal services organization that works with grassroots and community-based groups in New York City to dismantle racial, economic, and social oppression. My practice specifically, the Equitable Neighborhoods Practice, works with directly impacted communities to respond to city planning processes and private developers to help them make sure that people of color, immigrants, and other low-income residents who've built our city are not pushed out in the name of progress. Have you just heard from our colleagues at New Economy and the Cooper Square uh, Community Land Trust, CLTs are an opportunity for resident-led preservation of affordability in New York City neighborhoods. TLTs have been used for housing, for cultural space, for uh, commercial storefronts, and for preserving places where people work. We're here to urge you to make sure that new, the new citywide CLT initiative is included in the fiscal year 20 budget. We're part of the initiative as a provider of transactional legal services. As you may have guessed from Mr. Orsali's presentation, there's no small amount of actual legal work that needs to go in to creating a community land trust and making sure that the transactions are set up in a way that actually reflects the organizing. Um, there's bylaws to be written, there's offering statements to be made, there's uh, property tax negotiations with the Department of Finance, and we are already working with members of the initiative, specifically the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, Queens Neighborhoods United, the Mary Mitchell Family and Youth Center in the Bronx, and CAV, CAV in Manhattan and Nos Quedamos. This, the funding of this initiative would allow us to deepen our work with them, to expand legal services opportunities to other members, and also to do some training of other legal, nonprofit legal services providers so they can also provide transactional legal services to emerging CLTs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you guys for your testimony. I, I see uh, the Community Land Trust Initiative. Uh, there's two organizations that are in my council district, which is Nos Quedamos and um, Mary Mitchell. And I've had conversations with, uh, with Jessica Clemente from Nos Quedamos about it. Um, but there are other not-for-profits in my council district who are 
um, putting together or trying to figure out how to put together land trusts from their portfolio. Uh, you have Banana Kelly and Mid Bronx Esperados. Who they're, are they're also part of the initiative. They're just not our current clients. Yes. Though we actually work with them in a non-client on a non-client basis in response to the rezoning proposal that the city is putting together. Yeah. But in terms of actually being council on their transactions, these are the groups we already work with and we would love to work with the other groups in the initiative, which I don't have a full list in front of me, but maybe Julia does. I, I but Banana Kelly is one of them. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, well thank you very much for your testimony, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we're going on to the next panel. We have Leah Archibald, did I say that right? Leah? R Robert? Bill? Grill? Bro? And Armando? Chapel Lee Quinn? Armando? All right. So I guess Robert. Um, my name is Robert Brill. I'm outside counsel to Local 3 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I've appeared uh, with uh, Lance Van Arsdale of Local 3 before uh, Chair Ku's committee, and uh, I'm not sure yours, Chair Salamanca, uh, but perhaps the subcommittee on zoning and franchises uh, last year. I want to just quickly note, um, we were unaware that this, was going, this hearing was going to have public comment so we may want to supplement with writing of my comments today as well as amplify it. We look forward to working with the uh, committees with regard to budget issues, amongst other things. I want to keynote a couple of things, though, related to DOITT's testimony to you, which I think was lacking and unfortunately much too vague. Cutting the cord, which I think, Chair Salamanca, you were raising or they responded to you about cable revenue. So what they don't mention is that, one, these cable franchisees over a 30 or 40 year period of time have developed broadband telecommunications uh, using the inalienable property of the city. And the city has not done anything, certainly in the last decade, to recapture that revenue. So the notion of New Yorkers no longer using pure cable, called CATV, but still getting broadband internet access, voice over IP, protocol type telephone, telephony, uh, is false. I think um, certainly Charter and Altice, even though they are traditionally thought of as cable franchises, franchisees, have been deriving revenue from that. And I would add, even the Trump era FCC and the now sued upon Restoring Internet Freedom Act, which, by the way, the city of New York has submitted an amicus brief in support of New York State to oppose on constitutional grounds. Even they say that you, the city can still recover reasonable and fair uh, use of the inalienable property. So why aren't they doing that, and why are they not responding to you about, well, here's how we're going to try and recapture the revenue either by being aggressive and let them sue us and we'll go to court and fight them or not. Second, they didn't mention to you, at least while I was here and listening, that the Conflict of Interest Board issued in January of 2019 a disposition and settlement that a high-level regulator at DUITT was apparently feeding to his relatives at Charter inside information and giving inside information to Charter to correct things amongst other things. This is all now in the public domain. So you have to ask yourself, they had an insider to do it, helping a particular franchisee? What's up with that? And that deserves your attention and we look forward to providing you. That's in the public domain. This is something that got out there in January. I, I read that. I read that complaint. Um, so you you have a uh, you don't have a written testimony, but because you will you will put one together and make sure that we will get it to our give to the committee to the committee. All right. Okay. One, one the, more the, I'm sorry. Your time is up. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there anyone else from the public who wishes to testify? I see none. We would like to thank everyone for today's hearing. This uh, hearing is uh, hereby adjourned.